Oh no, I have one. Good morning, members. I trust that you are all able to hear me. My name is Regan Allen. I'm the chairperson for the Standing Committee on Community Safety. To my left is Mr. Wasim Matthews, our procedural officer. Further to his left is Ms. Mary Ann Burgess, our assistant officer to this committee. Members, welcome on this rainy day. Some of you are tuning in from the sunny Cedarburg area. We are here with the South African Police Service, as well as the City of Cape Town Safety Directorate, as well as the Department of Community Safety. I will allow members of the committee to introduce themselves for the record. Good morning, Chairperson. Ferlin Christians, a member of the committee. Good morning, Chair Lorraine Buerta from a sunny Cedarburg region. Good morning, Chairperson. This is Gillian Postman. I did submit an apology, but I will be attending as my alternate um, is not well, but my alternate might also be joining as well. Thank you very much. Duly noted. Good morning, Chair, uh, the leadership of SAPS and the department and the city. My name is Mesuli Kama. Good morning, Chair. Good morning to the department. My name is Ayanda Barnes. Chair, I'm also in the Karoo struggling with network in case I disappear. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, members. Good morning. Good morning, Chairperson. Um, my name is Ricardo McKenzie. I am here this morning and just listening in. Thank you so much, Member McKenzie. Members of the committee, in our discussions leading up to today, we understood that the matter is extremely fluid in terms of COVID-19 and in taking various precautions. I am glad that we have the hybrid model in terms of us engaging, even if we are not in the chamber today. I am extremely excited to be looking to my right-hand side, and I will now allow the South African Police Service to introduce themselves for the record. We are delighted that the Acting Provincial Commissioner is here, as well as the Deputy Commissioners. Thank you, Honourable Chair and Honourable Members. My name is Tem Sila Patikile. I'm the Acting Provincial Commissioner since the 22 February. 2021. As we go down, I've got Major General Verry, who is the Deputy Provincial Commissioner for Detections. And next to him is Major General Lincoln, who is the commander of the anti-gang unit in the in, in the Western Cape. Then far right is Major General Mining. He is the Deputy Provincial Commissioner for Visborn. And of course, then Mr. Roby uh, will introduce himself from the city. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much to the South African Police Service. I will now note the City of Cape Town Safety and Security Director. Good morning, Chair, and good morning to all the members. Uh, I'm Director Roberts. I'm representing Safety and Security from the City of Cape Town, and I'm the Director for Operational Coordination within the city. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll now note the Department of Community Safety. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, good morning to you and, and the members. Um, so from, from our side, um, I have the Chief Director, uh, Lindy Governor, who is present. Uh, Ms. Ansaf uh, Mohammed, uh, the Director of uh, Strategic Services and Communication. Um, Ms. Amanda Dissel, Director of Policy and Research. Um, our Chief Financial Officer, uh, Mr. Johan Brandt, uh, who is um, our support through the EDP on the uh, safety plan. Um, uh, Director of Police Monitoring, um, Louis Brown. 
Chair. I don't think I've forgotten anyone. Um, that's it from our side. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you so much, Advocate Pillay, HOD for Community Safety. Members, we have received an apology from the MEC, uh, Provincial Minister Albert Fritz. I have noted the comments made by Member Gillian Bosman as well. Thank you so much, members, for your attendance, the South African Police Service, the city and docks for being here today. Members, in terms of the hybrid model, and the rules of engagement, the standing committee rules will apply together with the ATC of Friday, the 17th of April 2020. Regarding the rules for today, to set the context for today, members, we are here to discuss gang related crime, also the investigation and crime prevention measures implemented to safeguard citizens in the province, especially in gang ravaged communities. In our discussions, we are acutely aware, members, that the issue regarding gangs are destroying the fabric of our society. To the acting commissioner, I remember the state of the province address in 2020, where a known drug house was 200 meters away from the state of the province address. And if Wade van Niekerk attended our, um, our state of the province address, you could have ran in less than 20 seconds. I saw him run 19.1 seconds before. You could have run to the drug house in less than 20 seconds. So we understand there's an issue. We understand that there's a role that SAPS plays, there's a role that community safety plays, there's a role that the city of Cape Town plays, but we also understand that safety is everyone's responsibility. And as a committee, we want to foster a collaborative approach in order to deal with issues as well as our oversight mandate as a committee. Members, I will be taking the matter forward in terms of the presentations and the proceedings. I do want to welcome each and every member that is watching online, as well as on YouTube and MS teams that have logged in. Stakeholders are key in this regard. I will allow for introductory comments from the South African Police Service. Thereafter, we will hear a presentation from the South African Police Service. Thereafter, I will go over to the city of Cape Town, then to the Department of Community Safety, and then we will bundle our questions directed to a specific entity. I trust members will find that in order for the flow of our meeting today. I will now note the acting provincial commissioner, but also a special welcome to, to Brigadier Foskel. Members, we have engaged with Brigadier Foskel before, so we are delighted that you are here today as well, sir. I will now note the South African Police Service. Thank you, Chair and Honourable Members. We understand and we also accept the fact that there is gang related, there are gang related incidents that are happening in in the metro, mostly in the metro. Um, but some stations would see that they, there is a decline in the incidents. But as you move from one end to the another end and it pops up and one incident, maybe you get four people killed or six people killed like in Mfuleni, that has happened this week. We are deploying, we are responding aggressively to those um, without forgetting the other stations that are actually problematic for all the years that I've been in the Western Cape and before my time. We've got strategy, the anti-gang strategy that was approved nationally and also the provincial one. But you may also appreciate the fact that since the COVID-19, um, some of, for example, the social part, the awareness campaigns would not go because of you can't get people together to any any place. So we're looking at the innovative ideas. How do we go? We've done few awareness campaigns as we've indicated. 
but that's that's the challenge that we would request all of us as the community and everybody uh, and our approach is to ensure that the street committees at the street level and in that case community uh, neighborhood watches uh, community in blues and as mainly the if we could focus our approach to the youth because the youth are and is the future and if we invest in the primary schools and grade R as we go up, I think that's the way that we will go as a long term. But operationally, I will then hand over to Major General Lincoln, who is the, the commander of the anti-gang unit, to take us through with the presentation, if that will be okay with you, Judge Chairperson. Thank you. That is perfect. Thank you so much. Um, General, if you are able to indicate when a slide must be changed, and then our procedural officer will accordingly change the slide for members that is tuning in online. Thank you so much for your introductory comments. We will be getting introductory comments from the city of Cape Town, as well as docs directly after this presentation, as we keep the flow of our meeting today. General, General, excuse me, if you can just switch on your mic. Thank you, Chair. I want to start with, with the, the, the first page in dealing with the scope of this, this presentation. It will cover the situation, the anti-gangsterism strategic focus, the operational approach, the intelligence approach, the role of the South African Police Service anti-gang unit in combating gang violence. And then we were looking, looking at the, the visible policing approach, detection approach, and community mobilization. Next slide, please. Okay, let's just deal with the situation first. Due to an increase in, in gang violence in the Western Cape, the anti-gang unit was established in November 2018. The aim of the unit was to dislodge and continuously disable gangs in identified areas. This includes the disabling of the illicit economy and criminal governance of gangs, as well as drug and firearm supply lines. The following police stations have been identified in terms of the anti-gangsterism strategy as hotspot areas for gang violence, as well as crime associated with gangs. These police stations are Athlone, Atlantis, Bishop Lavis, Belleville South, Belhar, Crutusville, Delft, Elsie's River, Hans Bay, Grassy Park, Hermanus, Hart Bay, Kensington, Kells River, Kleinflay, Kruifontein, Lentegier, Macassar, Mannenberg, Musenberg, Mitchell's Plain, and Fuleni, Ocean View, uh, Philippi, Paul East, Ravensmead, Steenberg, Strand, Stramfontein, Woodstock, and Worcester. We conduct focused operations in these stations on a weekly basis. An integrated focused approach with various role players within the city have, has also been adopted. Next slide, please. Chair, I think you're one slide ahead of me. <coughs> okay, you don't seem to have uh, the this, this slide uh, of the anti-gangsterism strategic focus. And there we're saying the following strategy has been implemented, an integrated approach with the Department of Community Safety, the implementation of the national anti-gangster a gangsterism strategy in terms of the enforcement by the anti-gang unit and then the focus on the 31 identified stations where gang violence is prevalent. Our operational approach, the following operational concepts are utilized to address gang violence within identified gang stations. It will be the intelligence approach, the visible policing approach, proactive and combat, 
the detection approach and community mobilization. General, can yes. I just double check? Was there an updated presentation? Yes, this is the presentation that we forwarded. It's slightly different to the one okay. that we have received. Okay. I, I think I, I will, may I just miss an apology. Who General Lincoln was away. Uh, but when we send that that one, so so that that's that's one that is on the table. It's one that we should be reading. Okay. That is, that is, and that one is the old version. That's in the, the current version is this one. Okay. Um, yeah. Slide number four. The following operational concepts are utilized to address gang violence within the identified gang stations, right? And that is the int intelligence approach, visible policing approach, detection approach, and community mobilization. Next slide. The following intelligence structures are involved in combating of gang violence. The Intelligence Coordinating Committee, the ICC, consisting of state uh, security agency, the SAPS crime intelligence and military intelligence. Then we have intelligence analysis and coordination, compiling of crime threat analysis and identification of hotspot areas. Then intelligence collection, collection on and verification of identified threats, provision of tactical intelligence, recruitment of informers, Profiling of persons of interest in order to compile a database of persons involved or associated with gang violence. Next slide. The role of SAP anti gang General. unit. Chairperson. Chairperson. General, just one moment. Yeah. Member Bosman. Chair, I'm not, Chair, I'm not sure if you're not seeing, not seeing my hand. My hand. Um, um, but I just want to I, I note your hand, member. You can go. Is it possible for us to get the presentation that's been updated on the slide? Because as you know, Chair, there are many members of our constituencies that are currently watching this via YouTube. YouTube. And I'd prefer if we have the correct presentation um, or the most updated presentation. Yeah. I, um, I have engaged the South African Police Service and this one is the most updated one, according to um, if you are able to confirm. Honorable Chair, I can confirm that that is the updated one. That's the correct one that you presented. Thank you. Member Bosman. Chairperson, so this is the, the presentation with our the strategic of the inserted into it is the most updated one. Is that, am I understanding that correctly, Chair? Um, I didn't hear the entire sentence, but General Vieri is going to respond. Uh, the first presentation that has that strategic focus additional slide and some in phraseology, that is the old one that General Lincoln led, he, because he was absent when we updated it. He just came this morning. This one that you are seeing there now, is the updated one. So ignore whatever was said on the previous slides on the old application uh, presentation. Member Bosman, you are satisfied with that? Uh, yes, Chairperson, for now, I think I'm, I'm satisfied. I will have a look at both presentations to see what information is different. Thank you so much. The SAPS can continue. Thank you, Chair. The, the slide that we are dealing with now is the role of the SAP's anti-gang unit in combating gang violence. The visible policing approach is to respond to intelligence. Visible and targeted patrols in hotspot areas identified by intelligence. Rapid response to incidents in progress 
as well as the stabilization of the situation, targeted actions to, to uh, seize illegal firearms and ammunition, contraband, drugs, and dangerous weapons, targeting of known gang leaders and members of gangs who possess uh, illegal firearms, and then assist detectives and crime intelligence in the ex execution of medium to high risk search and seizure warrants. Next slide. The role of the SAPS anti-gang unit in combating gang violence with the detection approach. Implement project investigations in order to address gang groupings and high flyers. Liaising with the Asset Forfeiture Unit, SARS, FICA, Customs and Excise in order to freeze and seize assets belonging to perpetrators of gang violence. To target repeat offenders in hotspot areas, including uh, bail applications and cold case management approach. Opposing of bail of perpetrators involved in gang violence. NPA-led investigations to ensure a speedy and successful prosecution of perpetrators involved in acts of gang violence. The investigation and tracking of firearms used in committing acts of gang violence. Next slide. The community mobilization. Mobilization of communities in affected hotspot areas to assist in partnerships and projects to reduce gang violence. And those are our neighborhood watches and street committees. Projects targeting youth at risk, i.e. the march and drill programs, sporting clinics and the safer school projects. And then just finally, I, I would want to say that COVID-19 lockdown regulations has hampered the successful administering of these uh, community mobilization projects. Chair, that is the end of our, our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, General Lincoln. Members, we will now allow for introductory comments from the city of Cape Town as well as the presentation. Good morning, Chair, and, and thank you, and uh, to the members as well. Uh, again, I'm Director Roberts. I'm representing the City of Cape Town Safety and Security Directorate uh, at this particular uh, session. Uh, just from the City of Cape Town is that uh, gang violence is one of the big priorities for the City of Cape Town in order to fight and to combat um, the, the scourge of gang violence in all the areas within the metropole of the city of Cape Town. Uh, the mandate is with the South African Police Services, and we are playing a supportive role uh, uh, to the South African Police Services in terms of Metro Police, traffic, law enforcement, our special investigation unit, and uh, our strategic information uh, unit in order to, to fight gang violence within the city of Cape Town. Uh, our focus uh, of uh, our deployments in terms of our integrated and joint approach is, is uh, go hand in hand with the operational approach uh, of the South African police. But for, for the city of Cape Town, it, uh, gang violence is really one of our priorities in order to ensure that uh, our community out there are having a safe and secure environment to, to, to live on a daily basis and, and to, to, to our youth out there as well within this particular communities to ensure their safety, their security, and to ensure that they can go uh, to, to, to school uh, and to education facilities in, in order to, to deal uh, with a normal life out there. Uh, my presentation today will be as follows. Um, the, the, the brief or the request from the provincial legislator, next slide. Whilst the city of Cape Town has also been requested to brief the committee on the integration of law enforcement officers uh, to the crime ridden areas within the, the Western Cape. Next slide. Our scope of 
Our scope of presentation will be the current operational approach by the city of Cape Town in terms of safety and security. And I will focus during this uh, part on our structures uh, of, of the policing services within the city of Cape Town and will also elaborate on our, all our focus areas uh, with regarding to the Metropole. Then the second uh, part will be the operational approach by the city of Cape Town in terms of gangsterism within the Metropole. And the third phase will be the current operational approach by the city of Cape Town in terms of our LEAP approach uh, currently. Next slide. It dealt, uh, just dealt with the current operational approach by the city of Cape Town and safety and security. Uh, you will see our structure currently with our executive mayor, Dan Plato, our city manager, uh, Mr. Bandwai. Director Roberts, if I can just one moment. In terms of the presentation, uh, I would consider that in terms of the diagram and certain matters that you're able to browse over, that would be perfectly in right. order, sir. Right, I will but do that key too. Aspects. That is just an indication of your structure. Next slide is the, the area of our operations within the four areas, west, east, north, and south. Next slide. Uh, that gives us an uh, indication of our law enforcement. We've got currently 1,462 operational members and they are deployed in the areas uh, north, south, south, and west, um, east and west, sorry, and then our specialized units within law enforcement that are uh, supporting us with our by law enforcement. Next slide, it gives us an indication with our Metro Police. We've got a total of 568 of operational members, and they are also deployed in the four areas, uh, north, south, west, and east, and then the specialized units within the Metro Police. Uh, the next slide is our Cape Town Traffic Services, a total of 332 operational members. They are deployed in the four areas, and then also an indication of the specialized units within traffic. Then, with regarding to the next slide, is our Strategic Information Management System unit, and they are responsible to gather information uh, within the, the four areas, and they are dealing with all the threats on a daily basis, and they exist out of eight members, a uh, new component currently. Next slide. Uh, Chair, with regarding to our city operational approach, our mandate is traffic enforcement and bylaw enforcement, and then also uh, in terms of crime prevention, and uh, part of our crime prevention are executed by the Metro Police, uh, supported by traffic and law enforcement. And part of our uh, uh, approach is intelligence gathering and analysis and coordination. Then also proactive and high visibility approach, our combat and reaction, uh, reaction approach, our reactive uh, through detection supporting uh, specifically with uh, the South African Police with uh, the investigation uh, in terms of our internal uh, and external uh, issues, and then communication liaison approach, and that is with regarding to law enforcement traffic, Metro Police, the SSIU, and SIMS. If you're looking at the, the different threats that's been, been addressed currently by our SIMS support on a daily basis, then we're dealing with all the crime categories, gang-related threats, transport-related threats, the marine, marine environment, protest actions, service deliveries, the school-related re threats, youth safety, domestic violence, housing and land invasions, firearms, drugs, and liquor, our COVID-19 level one, political intolerance, extortion, and corruption. Those are the threats that we are currently focusing. Next slides. I'm just going to, to glance read. It. it is just our operational partners with the partnership uh, with regarding to the department the departmental role players, as well as the external role players, uh, we are linking up with all our partners in the fight against crime in terms of coordinating meetings uh, currently. Uh, next slide. As part of our operational coordination, we are linking, as the city of Cape Town, we are part of the Provincial Joint Priority Committee, Operation Vutuawi, the COVID-19 Priority Committee, the Gang Violence Priority Committee, 
transport, school safety, rural safety, terrorism, uh, protest action and land invasions, murders, extortion, the safer city model, refugees, uh, the big events uh, within the city. Our focus at the moment, as I indicated to you, is with regarding to COVID-19 and the vaccine rollout, but also with regarding to land invasions. We are forming part of the operation with the highway, uh, that is currently implemented in the seven priority stations within the, the, the metropole. Then uh, we have got a direct link with gangsterism in terms of the anti-gang unit, and then uh, uh, with regarding to robberies, the, the integrated golden arrow uh, uh, approach. And we are dealing with that in terms of autonomous operations, integrated operations, and joint operations. And then we've got the LEAP project currently at the six identified stations, and uh, then the footprint of the CCTV cameras that link up with all the above mentioned operations, and then the safer city operational concept, as well as the safety plan of the Premier, and then also the recovery plan for the C uh, CBD. In our operational coordination, next slide, uh, I just want to indicate to you that all our operations are coordinated through our TMC Policing Joint Operational Centre, and the following role players are represented there. And Chair, should it be with regarding to gang violence or with regarding to the operational approach from the South African Police at the moment, or with regarding to the mandate of the City of Cape Town in terms of crime prevention, traffic enforcement, and by law enforcement, all of this uh, are coordinated within the TMC Policing Joint Operational Centre, and the, the following uh, role players are present in terms of the coordinating approach, the provincial traffic, Cape Town traffic, law enforcement, Metro Police, the Medical Emergency Services, Department of Education, Neighbourhood Watches, South African Police Services, Golden Arrow, and then also the private security. Um, uh, then we link uh, with the, the uh, PC, PECC 107 call centre, where all our calls are received, should it be gang related as well. Uh, there's a link directly to the Disaster Risk Management Center, the Fire Emergency Operational Center, the Freeway Management Safe, uh, System Center, the My City Bus Services, our EPIC uh, uh, regarding to pre-planning, a uh, link to GAPS, a link to private security, and a link to the MWEP operational approach. In terms of our operational approach in gangsterism, Chair, Ensuring effective and efficient crime prevention initiative and, and enhancing community safety of residents, visitors, and property whilst building the reputation of the city as a world leader. A continuation of joint policing efforts between uh, the city of Cape Town, Metro Police, Gang and Drug Task Team, and the SAP Anti Gang Unit. And that is an uh, initiative that is currently existing for more than three years at the moment. Uh, our mission continued is building a relationship between the communities and the city enforcement agencies and to strengthen partnership between enforcement agencies and communities to stand together in the fighting against gangs and drugs and then to disrupt gangs and drug activities through focus-driven integrated policing initiatives as collective. The Cape Town, next slide. Uh, the Cape Town Metropole has experienced a large amount of serious and violent crimes relating to gang activities. These activities include drug-related criminality, illegal firearms, and ammunition, armed robberies, murders, and attempted murders. The ongoing terror force lead to innocent community members being caught in the crossfire, injured or killed, and this has led to a negative perception in the media in terms of policing in these areas. Spin-off of crimes relating from the above mentioned are numerous and impact negatively both in terms of the community reassurance and the external investment. The Cape Town Metropolitan Police Department has a legislative mandate to enforce bylaws and to maintain traffic safety through the application of the National Road Traffic Act. It also has a legislative mandate to conduct crime prevention policing through a proactive policing initiative. As part of the aforementioned uh, uh, policing initiative, the decision was made to establish a gang and a drug task team 
called the GDT team with the Department Special Operation Divisions, which would aim at combating serious and violent crimes stemming from gangsterism and also support the South African police services. The Metropolitan Police Special Operational Unit includes various specialized functionalities, including the Gang and Drug Task Unit, supported by the Tactical Response Unit, supported by the Service Animals K9 and Equestrian Unit. These respective units, when working collectively, make up the Gang and Drug Task Team and partner with the various internal and external agencies um, and services, including the SAP Anti-Gang Unit, Traffic and Law Enforcement Services. The focus of the Gang and Drug Task Team is to make use of the multidisciplinary intervention and programs to successfully confiscate drugs, firearms, and to reduce the loss of life in the Cape Metropole. Running parallel to the enforcement actions, the division also embarks on gang and drug awareness campaigns through its animal service units aimed at educating the youth and fostering relationships with communities to provide information on criminal activities. The reward system for information policy has been used successfully, leading to many arrests and confiscations. Uh, ensuring effective and efficient crime prevention initiatives aimed at enhancing community safety uh, of the residents, visitors, and property whilst building the reputation of the city as a world leader. Sorry, that is uh, a reputation. Uh, sorry for that. I think you can just add the uh, next slide as well. Uh, next one as well. There was a slip up regarding to that. Uh, uh, just to indicate to you, we are uh, planning weekly on a weekly basis with General Lincoln and his anti-gang uh, gang unit. We are uh, supporting him uh, with regarding to the operations in the priority stations, uh, the gang priority stations within the city of Cape Town. We are part of the, the planning process. Uh, we are part of the deploying process. We are part of the operational monitoring and coordination process. And we are also part of the reporting back process where uh, General Lincoln will then uh, keep us accountable uh, to, 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 to report back in terms of our successes. Uh, but in terms of our total arrest affected uh, for the period the 1st of July 2020 to the 28th of February 2021, um, a total of arrests were made 478. Total drug-related arrests, 223. Total firearms and ammunition-related arrests, uh, 54. And then total other general arrests, 221. Uh, next, those are just pictures, and you can just slide free with regarding to our successes uh, in terms of our operations, um, with, uh, in terms of the gang and drug task team uh, operations. And uh, then uh, uh, the last part of my presentation will just focus uh, on our LEAP deployment current, the current operational approach by the City of Cape Town in terms of LEAP, our law enforcement advancement plan. Uh, the, there's a partnership between the, the Western Cape government and the City of Cape Town to have a thousand new linear law enforcement officers uh, in place for, the, the, for, for three years. Uh, the key points is the alignment of our objectives and the need for collaboration between uh, the Western Cape government and the city of Cape Town. Our main focus is to build the building of a law enforcement capacity and to address the high violent crimes and the murder rate. Uh, currently, with regarding to the scope includes uh, the recruitment, the training, the deployment, and the integration, vehicles and equipment, facilities, and the financial consideration with regarding to the LEAP program. Uh, if you're looking at the big numbers, at the, we, we are currently recruiting a total of uh, law, uh, uh, learner law enforcement officers, 1,000 uh, with 186 command and control, and the operational support structure of 68, finance and support services, 65, training college, 18, human uh, resource staff, 9, and uh, HR staff, temporarily two, with a total of 1,348. And those are the total of LEAP members that will be committed to this particular program. 
Our first LEAP deployment focused on our first phase with the six priority areas uh, for the initial LEAP uh, officers deployment. And uh, that is in the Hanover Park, Mitchell's Plain and the younger uh, area, as well as in the Delft and Bishop Lavers and the Kailicha area. Those are the current six uh, areas that the LEAP members are currently deployed in. And uh, our phase two that is currently starting off uh, uh, we, we are uh, finalizing our uh, training program and we'll start with our deployment of the next 250 LEAP members uh, from the 1st of April uh, to the next uh, priority stations, Mitchell's Plain, Kugeletu, uh, Cryfontein, Mumfeleni, Harare and Atlantis. Those are the 11 stations that uh, the LEAP members will focus on. Now, uh, the next slide. Our current approach is the focus of uh, in, in those five, uh, six areas, as I indicated, and we are linking up directly with the South African police services at those particular stations in that particular areas in terms of joint planning, joint deployment, joint coordination, joint monitoring, and joint reporting. And the focus of, of this particular deployment uh, uh, the focus is on, on five quick ones that were identified, namely the, the addressing of firearms within that particular areas, the ad addressing of drugs uh, that, uh, that's in that particular areas, alcohol-related issues, uh, persons of interest, should it be outstanding wanted, should it be uh, persons that are, uh, are having outstanding warrants, um, but those are the people that we are uh, tracing in those specific areas, and then also looking at environmental design issues that hampers currently uh, our policing efforts within those uh, six particular stations. Uh, I can just indicate to you that we are coordinating this on a weekly basis, and uh, we the the the, the uh, feedback. There's a technical committee uh, that are existing out of the city of Cape Town, the South African Police Services and the Department of Community Safety, where we then need to give feedback on a weekly basis regarding to our deployment or our operational approach and our successes. Our operational deployment in terms of the six stations, currently we are deploying a total of 88 members on a daily basis within the Delft area. In the Nyanga area, we are deploying a total of 73 members. Our Kailicha area, a total of 82 members. Our Bishop Lavis area, a total of 63 members. Philippi Hanover Park, uh, 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 deployment of 83 members. And in Mitchell's Plain, a total of 51 members. Uh, Chairperson, those are our members that are deployed uh, on a two shift system, a morning shift and an afternoon shift system. And uh, they are made available to the station commander uh, with the operational approach. And the main focus is to bring down a murders in that particular areas and to address uh, uh, the crime uh, that are contrib and the contributing factors that are leading to, to murders in those particular station areas. Uh, if I'm looking at the, the quarterly successes uh, for LEAP at the moment in those six station areas, from February to March 2020, one firearm and 45 arrests. Uh, from April to June 2020, six firearms and 98 arrests, uh, July to September 2020, six firearms and 183 arrests, from October to December, nine firearms and 460 arrests, and from January to March 2021, uh, 29 firearms and 757 arrests. And that gives us a total, total of 51 firearms and 1,543 arrests. And those are the contributions by our LEAP members in those particular station areas. Uh, the, the feedback is being given uh, for uh, 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 quality assurance uh, to the technical committee and General Barant, uh, uh, that is currently chairperson of the technical committee, are receiving these uh, particular statistics on a weekly basis and they're doing the quality checks and then there's also a, a oversight role uh, with regarding to what happened to these arrests, uh, are they ending up uh, be, uh, uh, at the court 
and also looking at the conviction rate uh, with regarding to this particular arrest. The focus clearly on firearms, on drugs, and on liquor, and those are the contributing factors that contribute to crime. If you're looking at the operational success, successes, and I'm not going into detail with it, but it will give you uh, the, the period monthly uh, with regarding to our successes in terms of firearms, uh, the confiscation of ammunition, the arrest made by LEAP, uh, uh, the total drug arrest, uh, houses search in those particular areas, suspect search, uh, Shabin's inspected, and Shabin's closed. So you will see uh, in our approach, uh, we are focused on that and we are coordinating, uh, coordinating that on a weekly basis. Um, then, with regarding to LEAP, linked directly to the Vuto Highway approach, as indicated by uh, General Lincoln as well, uh, we do, uh, in our own environment, uh, uh, gather information and sharing information at the, the, the planning sessions by the South African Police Services in, in, in this uh, particular areas. Uh, our visibility is on, as I indicated, in the morning and in the afternoon, uh, afternoon, evening shift. Uh, our combat and reaction approach, Chair, I just want to indicate to you, as you will see previously, I referred to the specialized units within Metro Police and within law enforcement and within traffic. Should we need to ask the liquor unit or the, 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 the uh, uh, metal theft unit or the K-9 unit or the uh, mountain unit to link up with operations in these particular uh, six identified leap station areas, then we will do it. And we also utilize our uh, specialized units to link up with the anti-gang uh, strategy uh, to fight gang violence in the identified gang stations as indicated by, by uh, uh, General Lincoln as well. Uh, the current seven priority station crime stations within the Western Cape that forms part of the 30 national top crime stations will be covered by LEAP project. So um, uh, in terms of the new strategy from the South African police and the identification of the 30 top priority stations nationally, seven of those stations are, will be covered by the LEAP deployment. So it is not a question uh, those, those stations that were identified by the, pro, uh, uh, the province or uh, by national in this province will also have the, 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 the deployment uh, of our LEAP members in those station areas and to help uh, fight crimes. Uh, those stations are currently in Yanga, Kailicha, Tjalf, Mufuleni, Mitchell's Plain, Kraifontein, and Harare. And eventually, when phase two is completed by the 1st of July, uh, and all our members are operational with the thousand members, they will cover all those stations. Just a way forward, and I'm concluding. Uh, it's the rollout of phase two, uh, additional 500 members uh, to the next five priority areas, the signing of 250 Lena law enforcement officers contract uh, happened yesterday uh, and is concluded, uh, the deployment and integration link to the command and control, and then in-service training will be on a continuous basis. And then the recruitment and training of another 250 Leonard law enforcement officers and the appointment and signing of the contract for the next 250 for the deployment on the 1st of July. And uh, that will also have in-service training uh, uh, responsibilities and then the financial. Uh, Chair, just in conclusion, uh, as the city of Cape Town, we are, we are really focused currently uh, with uh, uh, our mandate in terms of traffic, traffic enforcement and by law enforcement, but our focus is also for the prevention of crime within the metropole. And, and looking at the, the gang situation currently, we are linking directly with the South African police. We take the lead from the South African police. We are making resources available to the South African police in order to fight uh, the gangsterism in the priority area. And those areas where there's a flare up with regarding to, to any gang violence, we will make other resources uh, that is available on the day to normal day-to-day -day deployment also available for those areas 
uh, to address gang violence in that particular area. And then with regarding to our LEAP uh, uh, approach uh, that is focused on murders and uh, attempted murders and the priority crimes in that particular area. And the city is committed uh, to, to uh, make sources available and to support the South African police in the fight against crime. I thank you. Director Roberts, thank you so much for your presentation. Members, it is now 9.50. I'm delighted to hear of the integration work from the planning process until the reporting back, because it is in fostering those valuable inter-stakeholder relationships that we are able to work, um, to work towards improving safety. Members, for the record, I am going to hand over to the Department of Community Safety at this time. I consider the presentation read as circulated via our procedural officer, and I will request from the department if the department is able to touch on the key aspects of the relevant presentation. I trust members find that in order. I will now note Advocate Pillay. Uh, thank you, uh, very, thank much. you very much. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Chair. Chair. Oh, oh, my voice my is voice echoing. Is echoing. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Chairperson, uh, uh, just to uh, say that, to say that can you hear me echoing, Honourable Chair? We can hear you clearly. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, ju uh, just as uh, some opening remarks, the department has been working very closely with both the South African Police Service as well as the city to jointly address the safety challenges in the province. We have uh, assist with the development of the provincial response to the national anti-gangsterism strategy, where all other role players in the province um, were uh, involved in developing this uh, provincial uh, response, and um, the input was taken into account. And the department is also the co-lead in the anti-gang um, pri uh, priority committee, uh, together with the SAPS. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. So this is just an overview in terms of what the presentation will focus on. Uh, next slide, please. And then next slide. Uh, thank you. So um, in terms of um, our, our development of the Western Cape Safety Plan and our approach, there has been a violence prevention shift. So from having just a law enforcement response to an integrated law enforcement and violence prevention response uh, listed are some of the risk factors that impacts on an individual, on relationships between individuals, um, community members, and then society uh, at large. Next slide, please. So the uh, strategic approach to safety, the objective is to have safe and cohesive communities and uh, to reduce gang violence, to reduce gender-based violence, and by having um, social cohesion, by having increased safety uh, of public spaces through urban design, and then to have an enhanced capacity and effectiveness of policing and, and law enforcement. Next slide, please. Some of the key, key considerations for the safety recovery priority. So pre-COVID, uh, we have a, a Western Cape safety plan of which the objective is to reduce the murder rate by 50% in 10 years. Uh, 11 city priority areas for LEAP deployment. Um, the the uh, data-led um, um, interventions. Um, APEX priorities for all Western Cape government departments and a PDIA problem statement that focuses on repeat offenders. Uh, during COVID, there was a hotspot geographic uh, focus with a shared purpose, evidence-informed interventions, 
um, to have data-led uh, interventions, to be innovative, to be agile, to have multi-sectoral relationship that it taught us that multi-sectoral relationships matter, and then the impact of lockdown on uh, the murder rate and trauma. Uh, we we did. Um, uh, note that uh, when there was a curfew and an alcohol ban, the uh, murder rates and crime in general um, came down. And then when alcohol was unbanned and, and the curfew uh, lifted, we found an increase in the number of incidents um, um, in relation to murder, criminal incidents uh, in general, and then um, the um, trauma units that were under pressure during that time. And then um, in terms of part of the COVID recovery, we are aligning violence prevention and law enforcement. We're having evidence informed in a data led approach and uh, implementation in local geographic uh, areas. Next slide, please. Uh, our approach for the safety priority, next slide, please, is um, um, focusing on, on jobs, on well being, and the reduction of interpersonal violence. And our approach will focus on collaborative governance um, for us to have a data-led approach which would track the size and trends, um, the consequences of the problem, and also monitor the impact of our intervention. To have in evidence-based inter uh, interventions, we'll be looking at, uh, at various models, and then evidence for both violence prevention and law enforcement, and through an area-based implementation approach. Next slide, please. Uh, our data surveillance uh, strategy uh, focuses on defining uh, the data parameters from a revised theory of change to integrate data from multiple departments and sources to define the markers for impact with the area-based teams and then have a dashboard to track the markers for um, impact. It's a practical approach to evidence translation to have a data surveillance strategy and in an area-based uh, area um, and have area-based intervention. Uh, next slide, please. Our area-based interventions, um, uh, the steps undertaken is to confirm the priority geographic areas, to establish and mandate the area-based teams to implement and learn collaboratively to monitor the impact and refine our approach. Next slide, please. Our approach to evidence-based interventions, so a theory of change for mapping and evidence to identify key priorities from evidence base to have evidence translation for impact and for the area-based teams to implement these evidence-based interventions. Next slide, please. So a three-pronged uh, uh, approach, um, uh, one of social cohesion, one of law enforcement and one of urban design. They, we will be establishing uh, the social cohesion um, technical work group in the in the next uh, few days, as well as the urban design uh, technical work group. We have already established the law enforcement technical work group, and the, this will all land in an area-based space. Next slide, please. So some of the data uh, that we are monitoring, we are monitoring uh, the murder rate. Um, the objective of the safety plan is to halve the murder rate by 50%. So we monitor the murders on a week by week uh, basis and we focus on the uh, stations with a high murder rate and the priority areas. Next slide, please. We're also looking um, at um, area-based uh, area uh, profile data. So we're looking at um, mapping the population profile. We're looking at government services, transport, um, and looking at movement patterns, the crime stats, uh, the emergency me uh, medical services, assault, hotspots, um, community safety information, et cetera. And this is an example of what it looks like uh, for Hanover Park. Next slide, please. Uh, we are also um, um, have the um, HICT uh, uh, system that has been put in place where we're looking at uh, the, the e uh, emergency medical um, um, services um, has developed reports for each priority area. The system is now operational in 24 sites and we're rolling it out to other sites. Uh, these reports include detailed information on the time of injury, the type of injury, the place of injury, and uh, which aligns to the Cardiff model that has been very successful. And these reports will be drawn weekly and made available to all relevant stakeholders. Next slide, please. Um, Next slide. 
Uh, thank you. This just gives you an example of um, Hanover Park and in the assaults between August and October and some um, over a three month period, we see that the majority of the um, EMS cases occurred on a Sunday or a Thursday. And this is for Hanover Park. When we, we, we look at Delft, Kailicha and Nyanga, it showed more assaults um, that were um, attended to on a Saturday and a Sunday. So this type of information would also then influence uh, deployment on the ground. The next slide, please. Uh, and um, the data shows for Hanover Park that 30% of the assault cases uh, were attended to between uh, 9 and 10 at night. The increase in, in the cases between 6 and 7 in the morning may attribute it to people seeking assistance in the morning after an assault. And then it's for us to understand the time and the pattern of the assaults which would guide our resource deployment. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just in the interest of time, um, this is a model of collab uh, collaborative governance uh, that we're following. I won't go into much detail here, but we are under, uh, we're following a collaborative process that builds on trust, that focuses on um, quick and small wins as well. Next slide, please. Okay, um, uh, this is, it just shows you in graphic detail what we have done to date. So the steering committee has been established. An interim tech steering committee has been established. The evidence uh, stream is operational. The data surveillance stream is operational. We've established an evidence advisory committee. Um, and in the law enforcement technical committee is established. We are going to be onboarding the social cohesion technical work group as well as the urban design uh, technical work group. And uh, for the areas, we've we've have leap deployment currently in Hanover Park, Nyanga, Kailicha, Delft, Bishop Levis, and um, Mitchell's Plain. Next slide, please. Okay, this just also shows you in graphic detail um, the law enforcement. Um, uh, 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 committees or, or groups that will be established in the uh, six areas. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this just also shows you in graphic detail um, our onboarding of the social cohesion, um, urban design and law enforcement um, uh, technical work groups. There will be evidence-based uh, initiatives that will then land in the different area-based uh, teams. They are technical uh, area teams that are made up of um, social cohesion, law enforcement, and the urban uh, design groups. There will be six initial metro uh, sites, five additional sites thereafter, and then five uh, sites within the district municipal space. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next slide. So our area-based interventions, I know that uh, Director Roberts has covered this. So we currently have LEAP deployment in Hanover Park, Mitchell's Play in Nyanga, Delft, Bishop Levis and Kailicha. We will then be rolling out to Google Air to Kreifentin, Umfeleni, Harare and Atlantis. Um, the LEAP officers are signing their contracts today and a deployment on the ground will be as of 1st of uh, July uh, 2021. Uh, our area-based team methodology will be based on data-led evidence to guide interventions. The uh, area-based teams will ensure collaboration um, and will ensure um, coordination and monitoring of all interventions and operationalize service delivery interventions in that area-based space. And uh, the area-based teams will bring both law enforcement and violence prevention together and is, as is well-placed, we believe, to incorporate the other priorities of the recovery strategy, which are well-being and jobs. Uh, next slide, please. So just the six areas again, uh, where we currently have lead deployment and the law enforcement technical teams established. Next slide, please. Um, just in terms of the law enforcement technical work group, um, this has been established with the, de uh, the Department of Community Safety, the SAPS, the Economic Development Partnership, the City and the Institute for Security Studies. A uh, partnership has been created with SAPS and the LEAP in establishing area-based law enforcement interventions. The station commanders are leading uh, the joint operations in their areas. We've identified quick wins um, of which uh, firearms, substance abuse and persons of interest uh, will be monitored. 
Uh, next slide, please. Is some work of the technical work group. Uh, we monitoring uh, the deployments, actual versus allocated, work weekend versus the week, data uh, data driven. Uh, we monitoring uh, the actions, so arrest, execution, confiscations, fines, and some um, uh, fines issued. We monitoring our, our murders province wide and in the priority areas. Uh, we're doing mapping and design and also ensuring collaboration to improve operational coordination. Next slide, please. It's in terms of the rural municipalities, the uh, district and local municipalities have been engaged um, uh, um, on the development and uh, the review of the safety plans over the years by the Department of Community Safety. Uh, we have consulted uh, both districts and locals on the adoption of our area-based approach. Um, they've been asked to identify one local area within the district municipal space to implement our ABT approach. So we will have 11 areas within the city and then five area-based teams within the, uh, the district municipality so that we cover the province. And um, then in just in terms of the way forward, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, as I indicated, a steering committee has been established. Weekly meetings are held. The evidence advisory committee has been established and meets monthly. The law enforcement technical work group uh, meets weekly have, and have undertaken the following evidence based police, uh, policing model workshop uh, uh, has been workshop with the Hanover Park SAPS officers. It will be rolled out to the other areas as well. The identification of the law enforcement teams in the six initial uh, sites that I've mentioned. Uh, the law enforcement area tactical teams will be launched um, over the next few weeks in the six sites. Uh, a presentation has been made uh, to the um, SAP stock management team on the 8th of March at the PCCF, and we will be having further engagement with the cluster commanders as well as the station commanders. The municipalities, as I indicated, are confirming their areas for the establishment of the five area-based teams. We will be rolling out a uh, leap in, in the four additional areas of Gugoletto, Mpuleni, Harare, and Cryfontaine. We are in the process of promulgating the quick win liquor amendments to the Western Cape Liquor Act. Uh, we are onboarding uh, the violence prevention pillars uh, in the area-based teams. We are establishing the urban design and social cohesion technical uh, committees, and then also addressing very important quick win spatial and urban design interventions. Uh, thank you uh, very uh, much, uh, Honourable Chair. I'm done. Thank you so thank much, you so much. Belay, for the presentation. Members, as well as the South African Police Service, the City of Cape Town, and the Department of Community Safety, over the year, a number of residents have lost their lives due to gang violence. We understand that many communities are traumatized. Many are feeling the pain. We also feel for members of the South African Police Service and law enforcement officers that have lost their lives in the line of duty. We will now, members, in a very disciplined way, take a round of questions or seeking further clarity or engagement with the South African Police Service, the City of Cape Town, as well as the Department of Community Safety. We have a full house in terms of members attending today, and I will encourage strict discipline if you are able to state to which entity your question is directed or clarification on a certain point and we will take a hand i see hands are already going up for the first round provincial commissioner so we will take a hand we will have questions directed either to the south african police service the city or the department of community safety Members, I trust that you find that in order. We have taken an hour to get through all the presentations. The load for today is broad. And over the next year, we will be zooming in on a number of these matters as we conduct our oversight. But I will now note Member Christians, Member Bosman, in that order, Member Van der Westeisen, Member Kama, in that 
order. Over to you, Member Christians. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you for all the presentations. Just uh, to the South Africa Police Services first, the Western Cape Anti-Gang Unit. Uh, how, how many members belong to that unit? Um, uh, uh, because we have not heard our numbers. And then um, General Lincoln has also said that police stations have been identified for the anti-gangsterism strategy and that he gave all the police stations. I want to know, are those police stations more resourced than other police stations or are they dependent only on the uh, the the, the uh, Western Cape anti-gang unit? Um, just a question also on page, at, at, at page six, um, where General Lincoln said that targeting of known gang leaders and members of gangs who possess legal firearms. Uh, how did they obtain these legal firearms? Because of course you must do it through SAPs. Um, uh, and, and what is, you know, because we cannot understand the ammunition that gets out and uh, shots being fired on a daily basis. Uh, that can be one of the areas where ammunition is then, be, uh, is there control on ammunition per individual? I don't think so. So if, if, if General Lincoln can just uh, elaborate on that. And then, um, um, Chair, I just want to ask um, uh, um, Mr. Roberts, Director Roberts of, of City of Cape Town, there is um, the, the learner, uh, the lead officers being deployed. Um, the question is, are they adequately trained to do the job? Now, we understand that the main task of law enforcement officers is uh, by, law, uh, by law enforcement. Where do they get the additional powers in order to have all these units? Where, where do they get it from? And are they adequately trained? We also uh, would, I think, appreciate it in future if we have statistics on um, because you can arrest, uh, but we don't know the conviction rate when it comes to all these um, uh, all these different um, areas. And we really uh, appreciate it, but uh, you know we know that a lot of uh, a lot of people are not. I just believe that uh, uh, people are not um, uh, convicted, and that is one of the big problems that we have. And also now, I um, I just heard, um, just to advocate belay of the Department of Docs, I just heard uh, they saying rolling out um, to the non-metro areas. Now, I know the city has their specific areas, but I've no noticed that SAPS has already identified uh, Paul East and Hans by Wooster. Uh, why uh, are you not already in those areas uh, as to roll out additional elite officers to uh, the Klipfontein, Tigerberg, Kailicha areas. Why? I know the leap is with the city. I'm talking about the non-metro areas. Why you've asked them to give you areas, but the SAPS has already identified Paul East and those areas as problem areas. Why have you not proactively moved out to the Manas, uh, by areas? Uh, Chair, I'll stop it there for the meantime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Member Christians, members. I will request that we stick to a time limit of three minutes. There will be a second round, but I will also encourage members to remain disciplined in removing your hand or lowering your hand directly after you have asked a question. This will assist me to navigate and chair effectively. I trust that you find that in order. I have noted Member Bota's hand as well. I now see Member Bosman. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, um, thank you very much to colleagues from SAPS as well as the City and Docs for um, being here today. And we really appreciate the hard work that goes in by these um, men and women in the front line. Chairperson, my question, I know our scope is the City of Cape Town and the Metro, but my question is, around the gang unit and the work that it does across the province. How is the gang unit moving away from just the focus on the metro where we've got a serious problem, but also looking at other areas in our more rural communities where gangsters have now transplaced themselves. We've seen it with the um, haul of cocaine found in Saldana, and we also see it with gangs forming in towns like Kalatoa. I just want to understand what that relationship is. 
I also would like to know, Chairperson, what protection is being offered for police officers. We see officers being killed for guns. So what is being done to ensure that officers are safe um, and protected? And then what are the successes and failures of the army deployment in these hotspot um, areas? And what are the lessons learned from that? And is it an, an activity that should be looked at um, in more strategic detail? And then can we also get a detailed and um, written answer on the current process of disposing of illegal firearms in the Western Cape and how that links to the national system and what detailed numbers um, of guns that have been um, put out for disposal. And then, Chairperson, if I could know um, if we could get from the city of Cape Town have an understanding of what the relationship is between the city and the surrounding municipalities um, in terms of collaboration. I see they're working wonderfully with SAPS and with DOCS, but how are they working with other municipalities? And then if we could also get from the city an understanding, and maybe this is a written request as well, of what their organogram is for safety and security and how that links um, into the supporting role that they're playing, specifically as the city is moving um, towards focusing on its core mandate. Chair, I'll stop there for now, and perhaps I'll take another round or ask some questions um, in writing. Thank you so much. I will now note member Andrikas van der Westeisen. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, my apologies. I was in another meeting starting at eight o'clock, which unfortunately uh, in, uh, encroached on, on this meeting's time. And I wasn't able to introduce myself at the start of this meeting. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm uh, chairing the Standing Committee on Agriculture, Environmental Affairs and Development Planning. And therefore, uh, you will understand the angle of my question. The first questions, the first one is, uh, we are being told in my, uh, uh, our standing committee on agriculture that the Department of Agriculture is responsible for the drafting of a rural safety plan. So can we please be informed, A, to what extent has there been cooperation with uh, the role players that we have here in front of us today, and particularly then obviously uh, provincial and, and police SAPs in the drafting of this rural safety plan? And to what extent does this, you know, overlap or, or feed into the safety plans for, for districts uh, from SAPs? And then linking on to Honourable Christians, and I'm grateful that he has raised the whole issue of, of rural gangs, what actions are being undertaken regarding gang activity in places like Paul, Stellenbosch, and he also referred to Booster? And then, Chair, lastly, with my environmental affairs hat on, what actions are being undertaken regarding the, the poaching of marine so, uh, resources and how this links with drug peddling and particularly with, with the gangs? Uh, or are these uh, uh, um, poaching operations not linked to 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 uh, what you normally understand under gangs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Member Van der Westeis and Member Kama. I note you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And let me also welcome the presentations from all the uh, the departments that are here today. Uh, Chair, you know, one question that I have perhaps maybe to the three, which is the city, the department, and 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 subs, uh, because I see I see a lot of effort is being put. They well, everyone is talking about the data-led um, uh, approach, but uh, uh, I want to understand, Chair, what is it that because I, I I think I'm interested in 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 the challenges, the real challenges that we have in 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 fighting uh, uh, gangsterism, because if you note, Chair. Kaili Cha today is one of the top uh, MEDA uh, uh, prisons, but as, as, as early as 2015, there was a commission that pronounced on the interventions that we must have in Kaili Cha, and, and, and one understands that uh, there are some of the aspects that were not implemented. So I want to really understand what, what is it that we, we were failing to do or against us more advanced uh, than us. So that's just one uh, question, Chair, that seeks to go to all of, all of them. The other question that I have now for, for, for SAPS is that I understand that there is a, there is a district uh, model of policing 
that is uh, said to 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 start i think the, by the 1st of april now what i want to understand there is how will this impact on the current operations because i think changing to a district uh, policing means you are going to have structural changes in even how you, you you police so i want to check how will this affect will this assist perhaps maybe even the anti-gang unit in its fight against the uh, gangsterism in the province the the city of cape town chair one thing firstly chair that i want to register uh, through you uh, is, is that we, we i we really uh, i i'm really not happy with receiving a report uh, uh, 30 minutes before the presentation, especially such such an extensive uh, presentation. So, so we'll really appreciate to have it before time. But the question that I have, I see there are quite a number of arrests that are being made, uh, mentioned in the different slides. Now, I want to get a sense of our uh, conviction rate in relation to those arrests that were were, were 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 being made because we it's one thing to celebrate an arrest it's another thing to to have a conviction to make sure that someone pays for the crime that is being uh, uh, committed the question that I, I i i have to 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 dogs and this perhaps links to the question that i was asking to the city you know in the instance of the five i think it was the five uh, children that were shot in mitchell's plane recently an interaction that I had with Brigadier uh, Kulam, and I asked a specific question, do you have enough resources? He says, no, I have resources, even the province has sent a, a team to come and assist. Now, as I was talking to him, he then says, uh, we, we are following many leads, but uh, we're going to look and see people who have cameras in their in their houses and see how do they assist us. Although he was raising, he was not outrightly raising that as a, a challenge, but one picks that we, we really have a challenge of being able to identify these forever unknown suspects. We have a challenge of, 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 of CCTV cameras. The city is speaking about private companies. But what are we doing as a government at both levels, the city and the province, to ensure that we have CCTV cameras that will assist the work of subs in investing? And, and 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 preventing uh, crime. So I'll I'll stop there for now, Chair. Thanks. Sir. Thank you so much, Member Kama. I note Member Bwata. Thank you very much, um, Chairperson. I'd like to um, pose my question on the focus operations that SAP spoke about in the presentation. I just want to know, Chair, what is the frequent frequency of the focus operations done in the identified hotspots as per the presentation, those hotspot areas. And I want to know is does it happen simultaneously in all areas or is it just some identified hotspot areas? And then Chair, if you will allow me when um, SAP's response to member Christians' question around the gang unit. I just like to do a follow up in regard to what the um, what the res um, response would be. Thank you. Thank you so much, member Bota. Sorry, sorry, sorry. If you allow me. By in all means. Thank you. In regard to the informers, um, if SAFs can um, speak to informer numbers per the hotspot areas identified. Thanks. Thank you so much, members. I appreciate your discipline in lowering your hand online. Um, if I can jump in as well to the South African Police Service in terms of slide number five, and compiling of crime threat analysis, uh, especially in relation to gang violence. If you can speak more on that, please. I do also understand in terms of the drug houses or the clandestine drug labs, if my figures are correct in terms of the 2019-2020 um, annual um, report, it was stated there was close to 2,000 drug houses in the Western Cape. Um, are you able to give an update in terms of how many has been closed in the last year? 
or steps taken to close um, drug houses. The story I relayed earlier on with regard to being 200 meters away from one is that I know that three generations has brought has bought drugs at that very same place, from the grandfather to the father and to the son. Um, so that is clearly a problem as it is linked to gangsterism. In terms of slide number seven, um, if the South African Police Service can speak into how does that link to the DNA backlog and how does that affect um, the detection approach? And then my one last question, um, the city of Cape Town, if you are able to speak more directly with regard to the integrated approach um, with the South African Police Service uh, in these operations, uh, just to get a more broader understanding, that will be appreciated. And before I, I have one, and if uh, I would appreciate if we are able to, we've heard Member Kama speak about um, SEPs and under-resourcing, but just the um, SEPs to, to, to population ratio. Do we have that figures now at the moment? Um, I was hot. Uh, it's hot. So listening to a, uh, seeing a news article that one gang, for example, claimed that they had an estimation of 10K members in the Western Cape. Um, and growing up in Mitchell's Plain, I know that that gang is probably not even one of the top five gangs in the Western Cape. Um, so in terms of that and the staff complement that we have in SEPs for the Western Cape at the moment, that will be highly appreciated. Members, I see Member McKenzie's hand is up. We do appreciate all entities being here and members participating. Member McKenzie, I'm going to note you and then I will hand over to the various entities to answer. It will firstly be the South African Police Service, then the City of Cape Town, as well as the department, I will request members to listen carefully to the responses to note if their questions has been answered as there will be a follow up for this round. Member McKenzie, over to you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Chairperson. I do apologize, my throat is sore. Uh, I've tested positive for COVID-19, but this matter is important. Um, Chairperson, I'm trying to get an understanding of the coordination uh, between uh, uh, crime intelligence and our SAPs. We know that unfortunately the police crime intelligence is not where it should be at the moment, uh, but that's not what we're discussing. What is the coordination in dealing with some of these issues? Because we know some of these gangs are repeat offenders. Uh, some of the yeah. gang leaders are repeat offenders. And how are they working together to ensure these high flyers are being brought to big? I think that's what I'm missing from my perspective from the presentation. And then the second question also uh, to the top leadership on, on SAPS, what is their coordination between SARS and the Hawks and some of these high flyers? Again, we've seen these high flyers, they own massive nightclubs in Cape Town, they live in fancy houses in Platteclaw. And how can working with SARS, how are they not being brought to book? So what is their coordination to ensure to say, hey, SARS, but Ricardo is driving a Ferrari. His income doesn't match the fact that he can afford in Ferrari. These are obvious things that one would expect that there would be some coordination between SAPs, including the city of Cape Town, to say, but how can Ricardo afford to buy a house for five million than cash? Uh, has this transaction been picked up on the city systems? What is the coordination in dealing with some of these things? Uh, and the third question, uh, um, Chairperson, is when is there on a national level, uh, and we've seen the anti-gang unit and we appreciate that the, the on-the-ground work they do, some like the tens of thousands of police officers in law enforcement, but I just get a sense, that given where we've now seen from a, a suspended individual, a not suspended individual, head of crime intelligence, when, at which point is our SEPs Western Cape going to have stability? Because in my opinion, that have a massive implication with what's happening on the ground. And here we're not passing judgment or he's involved or he's not involved. That is not our responsibility here. 
But what we do know is when is the sense of stability so that SAPs can get on with it, doing their jobs or jobs of SAPs. So the point there says, is there understanding from the national police hierarchy that they need to appoint stabilize SAPs because once that is not happening, nothing will get done. Is this being brought to the top management of SAPs, including the national minister, the national command uh, SAP structures, to say, guys, if we don't stabilize the top SAPs in the Western case, we're not going to fight this ground. Is that debate taking place to ensure that you can effectively deal with gangsterism in this province? Otherwise, all the work Mr. Lincoln and his colleagues and the dreary on the ground, all that work is not going to make any difference if that top structure doesn't get sorted out. And I just want to get an understanding, is that debate taking place? Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Member McKenzie. We wish you a speedy recover, um, recovery as you battle COVID-19. Members, like I've indicated for the record, we are keeping discipline. The South African Police Service, as well as DOCS and the city, have taken notes on the questions posed. I will first acknowledge the South African Police Service, thereafter the city, and then the department to reply to various questions posed. I trust members find that in order. Kindly listen carefully to questions that you have posed and the responses thereto. I will now see the South African Police Service. Thank you, Chair. I have a panel that we brought that will be answering many of the questions, but I will take the last one from the Honorable McKenzie. Um, that one, a national commissioner would answer that one. But I must indicate and remind that it was in the newspaper that it, the national commissioner and the management, they're working hard to bring stability in the Western Cape. And, and, and I think that one, but as we stand here, we are here. We are working operational, we focus on our, our core mandate which is the, the is bringing safety in the Western Cape. And we are dealing with just that. And the other issues that the National Commissioner is dealing with, it's within the National Commissioner's part. Then with regard to questions that relate to investigations, who generally very well answer that and the firearms. And the other questions who General Lincoln will be answering and some of the questions who General Mine will be answering. But I will start with General Viri to deal with the detection and the issue of the firearms as that that, that was the, it becomes a, 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 a pending issue. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, um, if I could start. Uh, the question was around how did they get licenses, these uh, criminals, um, through corruption of our CFR system from our station level in terms of DFOs and applications, and I'll explain the modus operandi, right through to people inside CFR who manipulate the system at the head office. Now, I will explain this without going into detail because please respect, I am a state witness in this very matter that I'm going to be talking about. But on the 2nd to the 5th of August this year, uh, there's a trial starting in the high office, in the high court, uh, in which there are several 20, 21 co accused, including 28 gang members. A, two police officers from the Central Firearm Register in Pretoria, and uh, also implicating some members at a police station called Oliphant's Fontaine in Gauteng. Without going into much detail, because the charges have already been uh, a thing, there are 199 charges. This is a matter that started uh, um, to, to explain to you when I was station commander of Mitchell's Plain Seps and later consequent cluster commander, when we started checking on, we did a search of gang, gangsters in the areas, especially those who were boasting that they have legal firearms. And we were assured that they definitely did not come through our police station, which is as the law is required. We then established that they came via Olifant's Fontaine police station. And after that investigation, we established that, um, that everything from the entries into the register right through to our computer system at CFR, everything 
was fraudulently transacted in order to create the impression that these these 21, or to, let's say minus two, because two are two are police officers, that these 21, that the remainder uh, from the 28 gang, including the leadership, that they actually uh, profess to live in Oliphant's Fontaine as residents there, and that is it now. That is how they get the licenses, and the type of licenses they got was of concern because they were sports licenses, one, and um, that meant that they can purchase on a single transaction an unlimited amount of ammunition for the weapon. I think well into the excess of 10,000 rounds because you use it for sports purposes and need to practice for that. So the licenses in question were sports licenses. In our analysis, this certainly explained during the time when several I'll tell to be later detected several other gang leaders, but doing similar purchases and tracked the gun shops who were responsible. We then uncovered that a lot of the new ammunition that we were seeing in gang fights through the newness of shells and um, especially the tendency to suddenly in a short period of time since about 2010, 20, 2009, suddenly you see a firing of a large amount of rounds and a changing of magazines that is totally unusual compared to the, the previous period. So after detecting this, we were then able to go broader and then investigate where were large amounts of shots fired from a single firearm and then try, we, we investigate backwards. So we have come up by identifying much more so in short, in a nutshell, it is clearly corruption. And it is corruption that extends from a station level CFO, DFO, that as I explained, right through into our central firearm registry. These licenses are issued in a matter of three to five days for five or six weapons at a time. So it's large amount of weapons. They, in, in this case, they arrange an LMG and two pistols, Glock 1, Glock 10, very, fairly expensive kind of firearms that are all processed right through to position within two days. It involves an elaborate network of, of gun dealers that we are also going to charge in this matter eventually, gun dealers who accept falsified firearm competency certificates we have also arrested people involved in that particular process. And it has become a national investigation in this case. So that is how it happens. We have since then picked up that many security firms. Um, and that investigation was done further by Colonel Kinnear, uh, now deceased Colonel Kinnear, and several uh, uh, where security firms were also so armed at an alarming rate. So in some of the cases, we had people getting 51 firearm licenses in a matter of a week. And uh, that is more national Gauteng and also in this particular province. And um, in that particular matter, there were arrests made of, uh, of brigadiers in the South African police service, station commanders, uh, and the modus operandi is similar to this one of what I referred to the case before the High Court. Once again, corrupt CFO, alleged corrupt CFO, right through into the system at CFR level. But in that particular matter, station direct to direct involvement of brigadiers who was allegedly, alleged brigadiers who are station commanders. So that is essentially how these things happen. And they do not only happen in the gang world, they happen in the security industry, they, as we have proved as we have proven with our particular cases. Uh, that is on the firearms issue. Um, the other case of the guns that came from Silverton store, that is fairly on the record, what we call the Prince Lou guns. And I'm sure uh, given the coverage in the media, uh, people have, a f they are members who would, yeah, the members would have a fairly understanding of that unless they want us to go into particulars there.
Thank you, Chair. Chair, on the, the question of the amount of or the number of members um, in the anti-gang unit, um, there are a total of 191, of which 140 are uh, uniform members and 45 are detective members and six members are support members. Then just to go uh, further on the, uh, there was a question about the, the, the focused operations. Um, yes, what, what we do do is, is have, um, we have project investigations of which there are specific targets identified and our investigations then focus on those specific targets. So whether it's the uniform people or the detectives, everything around that particular area will focus on, on the target uh, who, who is being investigated. Then the third question, um, yes, we have moved our, our operations into the, the Overberg uh, and Worcester clusters. Um, because of, of, of gang activity, we, we will know, uh, note that, that in Worcester, um, there is serious gang activity with the JCY gang, um, as well as in the Overberg, the uh, gangs operating there, the Terrible Justice and, and, and some of the 28s um, around the, the uh, uh, Abalone industry. So uh, the anti-gang unit is operating in those areas as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Chairperson. I will take I'll take question. There was a question on the issue of the the safety of the police. How are we protecting our members vis-a-vis -vis this uh, threat of uh, gang violence? Uh, our members are trained, actually, and issued with firearms to protect themselves. There is training in terms of legal principles and. Uh, uh, also ensuring that they can shoot and utilize firearms to protect them. Uh, we make sure that they are also operationally ready. There are parades that are conducted to ensure they've got uh, service pistols and uh, ammunition uh, that they can use uh, if they are faced with it. In fact, uh, they have to protect themselves within the framework of the law. They are trained. They understand when to use the firearm to protect themselves and to protect other people. But also, if there is a threat on a member, maybe uh, from uh, gangs, then there will be a risk and threat assessment that is conducted by intelligence. And then that will be verified. Should it be found that a member then need protection, then protection is, is, is given accordingly. And that is will be reviewed over a period to see if the threat is still there. Uh, threat should be neutralized if there's a threat so that uh, it can be taken out of existence and the member can enjoy their freedom. So there is also a police safety committee that are looking at the issues of police safety in this regard. Then there was a question. I just want to, General Virez answered the question on firearm control, but I just want, as a matter of interest, to report that also there was a uh, uh, this amnesty initiation initiatives, uh, the community responded properly. We are happy to respond that we received 17,863 firearms, uh, which means uh, in terms of the uh, 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 amnesty, as part of the firearm control, we went out and uh, marketed the amnesty process and the community responded. So, And uh, also in January, we took firearms to Pretoria. The, those were firearms for destruction that we took to Pretoria. That is part and parcel of firearm control. It was about uh, 3,000 3, 3, firearms that we, we, we took for, for destruction purposes. I mean, there was an uh, audit that was done, uh, and Pretoria came here to verify these firearms were due for destruction. We transported the firearms safely to Pretoria. They arrived safely. So that is part and parcel of firearm control, I think. Uh, the, 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 this forum need to hear that. But also the, the other question I would like to answer is a question of the rural safety. We are part and parcel of rural safety. If 
part of the strategy nationally, provincially, and our stations, rural safety stations, are part and parcel of the rural safety plan. There are monthly meetings that are conducted in this province with all rural players in the agriculture industry. We are working together. Uh, even now, the, 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 the acting PC having arrived is also uh, uh, looking at rural safety in terms of flying squads. So we are part and parcel of that. Uh, it's an ongoing process. Uh, also, on the issue of poaching, there is, uh, uh, we were giving feedback on rhino poaching. We didn't, uh, since 2015 till now, there was no rhino poaching. In terms of Abalone, there are operations that are ongoing that were integrated with Coastal Marine and uh, our rural stations along the sea borders they are also working on dealing with the portion. There was also the issue of crocodiles that uh, uh, escaped at Bonneville in one of the rural areas. We worked together with the role players and we recovered 36 uh, crocodiles uh, that, that, that went into, into the river. And 44 of those crocodiles were also shot. So we are working together. I'm trying to, to, to show that we are working together within the, the, the uh, rural safety strategy and rural safety plan. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chair, thank you, sir. I think we will fill in some of the questions that we have if we've not. Uh, for example, uh, the member, Honorable Member Kama, if I'm pronouncing correctly, um, what is the problem? Why are we not getting the violence down in the, the gang violence? Um, one should also look at, uh, for example, if you go to some gang stations when you, where you operate, you get your vehicles attacked down by the community members because there is an alternative governance and economy that the gangs are providing those communities. If we could just arrest that part, uh, for example, the indigenous, we identify the indigenous people and then the state provides the necessities because now the gangs are preying on that then and when we go in, we get attacked. So now we must infest of or now deal with the attacks that the community is throwing stones at you. Now, secondly, on the Kailicha Commission of Inquiry, I think then we advocate Pillay will then continue, but we want to, on our side as a police, we have resourced, we have met many of the things we're supposed to have. And I think the leap that is happening now is, is in response to that, but I think advocate Pillay will then uh, elaborate on that. Um, I must also say that the, well, we not want to, to blame COVID, but the interaction with the community has lessened since the last, since Feb, March last year. And uh, we've had to look at alternative means of communication, losing our, our own loud hailers and uh, the, the, the local radio stations, but there could be more. Uh, for example, as I, I we maintain that if we the crime is happening at the block and at the station level, at the street level, and then if the community is at that street, they, they, then they are taking ownership of safety in that street uh, with us, the community patrollers, and also ensuring that the youth, uh, because the youth is actually the future of the country, that we redirect their alternative role modeling because that's another problem that we, we think we're seeing. That if you have the cold chains and you're driving fancy cars and, and then you are the right person, you don't have to go to school. And I think that's one message that we need to look at it. Now, and as far as the, what are we dealing doing with the, the high flyers? I mean, the Minister of Police has just recently announced that uh, the projects that have been done, they, some big guns have been taken down to court. And there's some projects they take long. They take two to five years to, to complete. And in that, then SARS as asset forfeiture unit and other road players are involved. And also, uh, when you talk about the one that you say to 2,000 houses, then I, I'm sure that when we we would we, we then just have to submit in writing because we we wouldn't say now how many houses we've confirmed as gang as, as, as drug places. Then we will submit that in writing to, to say what 
whether it's reduced or not. And one thing that is a challenge is the fact that today you arrest, you take the drugs there, and then six months down the line, that very same house, it's again, uh, uh, as you are saying, generational uh, career in drugs. Uh, but we, we, we are working on that, and then it is good that we also get some information on those so that we can also focus our, our, our attention to those with the other stakeholders like SARS and, and, and uh, asset forfeitures and, and, and the city if, they, if it is a, is, a, is a municipal house or something. Now, in as far as the, 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 the marine resources are concerned, we need everybody. We really need all the people. But I just want to say there has been a, an improvement, especially in the overback, with the, the working between the community and the police and other law enforcement. We've been getting many successes. <laughs> Honorable Kamo was asking what could be a possible solution to bringing, placing the 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 perpetrator at the scene using cameras. I don't know if it's about him or Honorable McKenzie. The way to go is the safer city approach with a smart city, which I think it has started, we, we started um, the National Commission and I think in the Western Cape also had started, but perhaps now we have to go to revive and re relook into that uh, city because if we wire our roads with CCTV cameras, then we are able to place many of the, the, the people through the artificial intelligence so that we can gather that information. Most of the time, when you get to the scene, nobody wants to talk and never, never any person wants to talk. So the, the, the first safer city approach will, will, to a greater extent, make solutions. We've seen where the system cameras are work when we've used system cameras, uh, CCTV cameras coupled with short spotters uh, in, in many of the other areas and in other informa information that we could have. That would then have in the fusion center or, uh, well, say now, uh, and the new word, uh, in the command center where all other stakeholders, security company, who are all working towards uh, prevention of crime, that we are all together and sharing information and then that then will assist in getting the perpetrators and, and achieving prob um, proving our cases in court. And that's, I think that's all, all the, the one of the most important one is to now engage and approach the safer city up model. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, feedback uh, regarding uh, the city of Cape Town. Uh, in terms of member questions, in, uh, with regarding to the, the training of the, the LEAP officers, uh, I'm just going to indicate to you that uh, the LEAP officers and any law, learner law enforcement officer uh, has been trained in terms of peace officers training as well as uh, traffic warden training. And uh, now in terms of uh, the, the powers with regarding to a traffic warden, I just want to indicate to you that uh, traffic warden appointment, a declaration of a peace officer in terms of section 334, of the Criminal Procedure Act uh, 1977, Act 51 of 1977. That is regarding to a uh, traffic warden. And then in terms of section 19 of, uh, uh, sorry, I just, uh, in terms of traffic wardens appointed under section 31 of the Road Traffic Act, Act 29 of 1989. So uh, firstly, I just want to indicate to you uh, the traffic warden training and the appointment with regarding to a peace officer uh, in terms of uh, the Road Traffic Act. And then I'm coming to the peace officer's training, and that is in terms of uh, the Section 334 of the Criminal Procedure Act of 1977, uh, with, uh, referring to the government notice 1114, of 2018. And uh, Member Christians, uh, I've got the other uh, legislation and powers as well, the Section 19 of the Criminal Procedure Act 77 of 1951, Chapter 2 with regarding to search warrants, 
entering of premises, seizure, forfeited, and disposal of property connected with offences. And then I've got also uh, Section 23 of the Criminal Procedure Act that deals with the search uh, of uh, arrested persons and the seizure of articles, and then uh, powers in terms of Section 4.1, uh, with regarding to the name and addresses of any suspicious person or a suspect uh, that's been arrested. Uh, uh, um, so that is the pose. And then also uh, Section 44, the execution of a warrant. And then uh, the bylaws regulations made by uh, and for the municipality. I've got the, the presentation available to you with regarding to all the powers of learner law enforcement officers uh, that has been appointed as a peace officer, and I can make it available to you for, for circulation. Then just with regarding to the training of our uh, peace officers, uh, they get trained, the, the period is for a period of three months, and then um, there's also in-service training uh, that is linked to that particular training. Now, the training that has been, been offered to them is firstly the, the peace officer's training, as well as the traffic warden training, and then uh, with regarding to the bylaw training, uh, bylaw enforcement. So those are the, the three main areas of training. And then the fourth very important uh, training is our tactical training, where they then receive training in terms of firearms, uh, uh, and then also with regarding to stop and approach, searching, tongue training, radio etiquette, and fitness. And, and then there was also a request put out to the South African police. Uh, the police assisted us uh, with regarding to the training of crowd management, and the request was put out to the, the South African police to, to also assist us in order to train our members in crowd management on crowd control, specifically with the Marikana report that is currently on the table, and, and to see in order to address uh, protest actions in this way. Um, then, uh, with regarding to in-service training, uh, uh, member Christians, uh, there's ve uh, various uh, specialized units within uh, law enforcement, and specifically with liquor and second-hand goods, we, the, the police assisted us in training our members in second-hand goods, and um, uh, we are also uh, embarking on having all the learner law enforcement officers trained in, in terms of uh, liquor and second-hand dealing. Then, uh, uh, when I'm getting to, to Member Bosman, with regarding to the relations between the surrounding municipalities, yes, uh, uh, specifically with the, the surrounding municipalities on the borders, uh, and I'm talking about Wifferberg, Stellenbosch, Paul, uh, Malmesbury and those particular areas, uh, there is a, a, a relationship uh, between us. Uh, the other day, there were uh, major uh, problems experienced in terms of land invasions within the Grabo area, and there was a request uh, put uh, by the uh, Overberg municipality to the city of Cape Town to assist them in terms of the land invasion and with the, the management of the M2 that was closed at the time. Um, and if there's a request, uh, the city manager will grant it that authority in, in dealing uh, with that uh, specific request, and we will assist as far as our resources allow, allows us. Then, with regarding to the organic room for safety and security within the city of Cape Town, as I indicated to you, uh, we've got an acting executive director currently, Vincent Botto. He's in the place of Richard Bosman. Uh, he's our executive director, and then uh, I'm the director for operational coordination, and I'm coordinating all the operational issues uh, between Metro Police. Uh, there's a Metro Police chief, that, uh, and Metro Police is appointed in terms of the Police Act, uh, and that is Chief LaRue, and then the, the units that are accounting directly uh, with regarding to operational coordination to me is uh, then the Metro Police, uh, uh, the traffic that's been uh, aided by Chief Thomas, uh, the Chief of the VIP unit, uh, Lawrence Apro, the Chief of the Law Enforcement unit, Chief Wiltshire, and then the Commander of the 
the strategic information management system, uh, Ricardo Furi, and then the specialized investigation unit, Chief Miguel. That is currently uh, the policing agencies both in safety and security, and then we've got disaster management, fire and rescue, and the PECC uh, uh, 107, and then we've got also events as part of the safety structure. Then in terms of um, um, member from the West Asian, uh, with regarding to the rural safety plan, uh, I can just indicate that we've got currently we are in consultations with the South African Police Services in uh, training of our rural safety unit uh, with regarding to the uh, rural safety plan. Uh, we are already coordinating with each other with regarding to meetings. We are attending all the rural safety meetings uh, of the South African Police Services as the city of Cape Town and with our current rural safety unit within the city, we are attending to that. In terms of marine resources, we've got a marine unit uh, 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 within uh, the law enforcement environment that forms part of the integrated approach uh, with border policing and uh, uh, death, uh, in, and we form part of integrated operations, joint operations, and we've got our own mandate with regarding to our bylaw enforcement in order to protect the marine resources along the coast. Uh, in terms of Mr. Kaba, uh, firstly, I want to apologize, uh, sir, for providing this uh, uh, presentation on such a late stage. Uh, it is my fault, and I apologize for that. Uh, I should have uh, forwarded that uh, presentation yesterday, and I will uh, make sure it don't happen in the future. Uh, with regarding to the, the integrated uh, uh, approach with the South African police, um, Firstly, the city of Cape Town is a member of the uh, provincial joints, of which uh, the acting provincial commissioner, uh, General Patakile, is the chairperson, and uh, myself and the Metropolis chief and the executive director are represented on that prov provincial joint uh, uh, provincial joint coordinating forum. Then the city also served on all the priority committees uh, with regarding to the that is established in terms of the provincial joints. Then we are also form part of the prof job uh, with regarding to, to the various fleets. Uh, should it be uh, the COVID-19? Uh, should it be the refugee exit plan at the moment? Uh, should it be the court command group meetings? Uh, should it be the anti-gang violence uh, or anti-gang uh, 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 gang, uh, uh, forum of General Lincoln? Uh, we form part of integrated planning and there is good cooperation between uh, the city of Cape Town and the police at the moment. Uh, we also, uh, uh, in terms of our oversight role uh, that is being dealt uh, by the Department of Community Safety with regarding to any inquiries in terms of our cases, uh, we did as a city uh, send a letter to the, the provincial commissioner uh, in terms of the watching brief regarding our own cases in terms of firearms, drugs, and liquor cases, and all the cases where the city are initiating the uh, risk in order to, to make sure that that particular case has ended up in court or there's a conviction with regarding to those cases. And that is why a uh, watching request later was directed to the provincial commissioner, and we are waiting for a meeting to be set up uh, between the city and the provincial commissioner in terms of that. Uh, in terms of the CCTV camera footprint, uh, I can just indicate to you that uh, uh, we need to, to make use of technology to fight crime uh, due to the, the, the resources out there. And what we did from the city of Cape Town is we look uh, how we can uh, uh, address the cameras in a different way. Uh, we identified all the footprint of cameras in the gang areas at the moment. And every incident that is detected, uh, should it be a drug smuggling, should it be a shooting incident, should it be a threat that is being identified on the camera, it is then communicated immediately with the SAPS, who is part of our deployment in that area. Uh, we've got the footprint with regarding to land invasions currently in terms of that. And then we are currently busy with the footprint 
uh, of the, the seven priority stations to see what cameras are in those particular areas in order to, to deal with that instance and that there's uh, communications with the SAT. And then uh, with regarding to the leap areas, the footprint of the cameras in each of the leap areas were, was submitted to each of the station commanders. So there's a link with the SAPs at the TMC and there's a link with the footprint at, at the various stations in terms of gangs, land invasions, uh, uh, the leap stations, as well as the seven priority stations. And there's also a link with regarding to the safer city approach, as General Mansi indicated here. And then uh, there's a particular working stream just on the, the safer city concept uh, on the, in terms of technology. And we are also making use of the freeway management systems currently. So that is just feedback with regarding to member Cabo. In terms of uh, member Bota, with regarding to the integrated approach with SAPS, I think I already mentioned it with regarding to all the forums and with regarding to the, uh, uh, the execution of joint and integrated operations and all the forums that are currently coordinating uh, the integration. In terms of uh, Member McKenzie, I just want to indicate to you we attended a workshop, uh, extortion workshop, the other day with the South African Police Services and all the other role players uh, that were identified to be part of the extortion uh, 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 approach or strategy uh, currently within the Western Cape. And we make it, a, a, we indicated to uh, the South African Police that all the systems of the city of Cape Town, should it be housing, should it be uh, 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 accounts whatsoever, if there's a need for information, they can tap into our systems and we can make that uh, information available. Um, to, just with regarding to the last input in terms of CCTV cameras as well, uh, we are making, we are willing, or we, we offered actually all the footage that is being recorded in terms of the CCTV cameras uh, to be made available to the crime intelligence of the South African police uh, to analyze that footage, to make sure if they can identify uh, groupings, uh, gangs, syndicates, individuals, whatsoever in terms of that, and they can make use of that particular information as well. Thank you. I will now note the Department of Community Safety. Uh, thank you, uh, very, thank much. you very much. Oh. Honorable, Honorable Chair. Chair. Just in terms Just in of member Christian's, Christian's question, Honorable Member Christian's question, our priority for implementation in the um, 11 areas has been uh, the um, murder rate. So, and all the murder stations are currently located within the Cape Metropole. Uh, we are engaging with the district municipalities and the local municipalities for their input as the success of any of our interventions in that space depends on their support, their leadership and their guidance to our initiatives. We have requested from the SAPs uh, to provide us with further information to guide our engagements with the district municipalities as well as the local municipalities so we, that we take into consideration um, uh, the um, challenges that are faced as, uh, as mentioned by Honourable Member uh, Christians in Pal East as well as the Hans by Hermanus area as well when we set up our area-based teams. Uh, but also just to say our area-based team approach will not just also be confined to a specific area. We would like to, to set up area-based teams going forward in other areas as well, because we, do, we are aware of the fact and are sensitive to the fact that there are so many areas within the province that requires uh, attention as far as uh, safety um, of um, the, the citizens are concerned. Um, just in terms of Member Kama's question, so uh, Member Kama, our engagements um, following uh, the Kailicha Commission of Inquiry recommendations have continued. Uh, we have um, been having weekly meetings that focus on the Kailicha and Eastern Sub District, and of late it has been now bi weekly meetings, which are attended uh, to by the SAPs and all other role players within the Western Cape government, the city, as well as community based structures like the CANS, as well as the Kailicha Development Forum. We have been focused 
focusing of late on COVID initiatives, but also other matters affecting service uh, delivery. Uh, we are also working collaboratively with all uh, stakeholders, and I do believe that the area-based team approach, which has also flowed out of the Kai Licha, uh, Commission of Inquiry recommendations of how one should engage as the whole of the society and how government should best engage with communities, will also address some of the key challenges in uh, the area. And then once we have the, uh, the urban design as well as the social cohesion uh, technical work group set up, uh, which will then further complement the work of our law enforcement uh, technical work group. It will definitely address uh, and take forward the recommendations of the Kailicha Commission of Inquiry. In in relation to the question on this, the cameras, uh, member, uh, Honourable Member Kama, we did during our implementation of the alcohol harms reduction game changer, we did set up uh, cameras in Kailicha that have proved to be a very effective deterrent uh, to crime. And that's some of the learnings that we'd like to build on and then also have uh, both the SAPs as well as the, the National Prosecuting Authority to utilize uh, f uh, footage uh, when it comes to the Commission of Crime for Successful uh, Investigations and Convictions. And so we are jointly engaging also with the SAPs and especially the acting PC during our weekly meetings to see how best we can support the use of technology um, and support uh, the SAPs um, in, in their uh, fight against crime um, by the utilization of uh, technology. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you so much, HOD. I've SAPS indicated there's two additional questions. Members, I have already noted two hands in the form of Member McKenzie and Member Bosman. You are allowed to raise your hand for the follow-up questions and to accordingly uh, uh, prepare for no longer than two minutes. So I'll note the South African Police Service. Uh, there was a member, I'm not quite sure, who asked the question about the DNA matter and the challenges. In, it was yourself. Okay. I just want to answer that very, very clearly. It, um, I'm going to try and simplify the nature of the challenge. Firstly, we have backlogs, and I'm talking as a detective, that our forensics will not be able to meet in the foreseeable future at the pace that we are usually used to. And I'd explain to you what the nature of the challenge is. It involves two particular forms of challenge. For the past four years, three through four years, we've been having disruptions in what we call the supply of the chemical reagents that you need to conduct the analysis. Okay, Sci scientists in the room will understand what that means, which means for us in the court as detectives, that if these chemical reagents are not there, the analysis can't be done, and therefore we won't have the result available. Simple, practical. So that's, 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 that's what that has meant for us. There are serious backlogs, given the disruption, that constantly need to be, 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 be met in that regard. The second part involves a contract dispute between the FDA and uh, the SAPs and that involves the Property Control Evidence Management System, or PCAM, as the word is heard around there. Now, this challenge is also causing major backlogs um, of a little bit more frightful nature because when we present evidence in court, even if the samples are done, whether it's DNA or anything, it doesn't even mean it's only DNA, then we have to prove the integrity of possession, of the chain of possession of that evidence while it was in our custody. In other words, it was in a 13 store, it was in a went to forensics, it was tested there, it came back, and all those kind of things. Now, that whole system is managed by what we call electronically by the property, by the PCAM system, and no more by a hand paper system when we started moving over to the peak. And there are still references, but the integrity that we presented to court to prove that these things are handled from the perspective of continued continuity of chain of position depends on the PCAM system. Now, 
as was evident in the submission of the FDA and by the South African police for a considerable period of time, uh, the system was switched off. So now as detectives, we will have to go either back to a manual way of going to reprove that we had continuity of position of the evidence of whatever that was, or reinvestigate entirely. So that is the practical thing when it comes to evidence managed under the PCAM system. And it's not only DNA, it's firearms, it's whatever goes into our SAP 13 store and from there further up the chain and back before we present it to court. So that is the nature of the challenge. Uh, they cannot be fixed by us as detectives or by us in this province. It is a national supply chain issue. And that question about how far and how fast, that is the best left to the National Commissioner to answer. But as far as we're concerned, that is in reality how it does affect us at this point. Lastly, Chair, was the issue of restructuring. To what effect does it hamper our, 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 our operations? The answer, no. Firstly, it is aimed at efficiently uh, managing the resources, uh, redirecting resources where they are needed. So the National Commissioner was as pronounced on the restructuring, but then there was going to be a media, a media release today. I'm not sure if it's still can go. So we will leave that one there for the National Commissioner also. we we'll wait for the, the, the announcement that he, uh, he was going to have today. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Commissioner, as well as General Vieri. I appreciate those remarks. It is concerning, um, and we have had a, um, an appointment um, with the FSC, Forensic Science um, F, FSL, um, and we are planning to do an oversight after the constituency period. Um, but thank you for the frank and open answers. Um, members, I have noted Member Peter Mare, um, you are noted in the meeting, sir. Um, I'm going to take a hand of follow-up questions specific to your initial question that you posed. But if there's any additional question that you have um, uh, for no longer than two minutes, it is now 11.17 and I am aware of the time. I have noted Member Bosman, I've noted Member McKenzie, I've noted Member Kama, and I've noted Member Mare. In that order, I see you, Member Bosman. Thank you, Chairperson. Chair, I'm encouraged that the SAF's Western Cape leadership is looking at using technology in the form of cameras and um, artificial intelligence um, to assist in crime fighting. But my follow-up would be what equipment and what um, CCTV cameras does the South African Police Service currently own and operate on their own? And this is outside of what belongs to the provincial government and what belongs to private security companies and what belongs to the city of Cape Town. And uh, the second part of that, the follow-up question, Chair, is if the South African government does not even own its forensic uh, database and there's a dispute with FDA, which I still don't understand the nature of, um, how can we trust the South African Police Service to effectively manage cyber, um, not, sorry, cyber digital um, policing and online policing um, when we don't have that capacity. And then the other question, Chair, is what capacity currently exists within um, crime intelligence to actually monitor, catalog, um, and understand the footage that municipalities are making available to them? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Bosman. I see Member McKenzie. Thank you, Chairperson. It's clear from my three earlier questions that either there's no coordinating taking place or it is not working because I didn't get a clear response what's happening. If it's not working because we see the high flyers in Cape Town still roaming around the streets. 
Um, Chairperson, the, the supply chain management at National now affecting thousands of cases in the Western Cape. And I want to find out from our, uh, the SEPs in the Western Cape, what is the plan going forward? Because obviously National is not functioning. I mean, we, we can see it on the ground. We read papers every single day. Supply chain is not working. And as uh, Mr. Veri said, then I have to redo the cases by foot if I uh, heard him correctly. Uh, uh, and how long is that going to take? Then the second part of the questioning, Chair, is related to the recent report on the gender-based violence. Uh, and out of the 50 cases on gender-based violence by the uh, um, unit uh, in the Department of Communications, 30 dockers were not at court. I'm trying to understand what happened. Did the officials, the detectives, not have petrol money not to get to court? Were they off sick for the day? Because cases were struck off the roll. And that report in itself we need to discuss in the future, Chair, because and 20 dockers were incomplete. Was it manpower issues? Because the, and there are serious implications. Because victims are obviously now saying, well, you guys are not doing anything about it, uh, Mr. McKenzie, because the cases were withdrawn. And these are serious cases, rape, assault, GDV, murder. And we need to get an understanding what happened. What are the cause of these issues that detectives or investigating officer mm -hmm. cannot get to court? Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Member McKenzie. Um, that is definitely on the program regarding the court Watching brief, I now see Member Kama. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Let me also extend my appreciation for the responses so far. I think they were very uh, good responses from all uh, uh, the, the presentations. Chair, the follow-up that I, I have, the reason why I was asking about the conviction rate in terms of the arrest, what I'm trying to to to... Uh, ascertain uh, is, is is whether we're doing I see we're doing something about crime but I, I really want to check what are we doing the right things because really we're losing uh, uh, lives every day so I want to I want to I want to uh, uh, check uh, chair because if you let's use the recent uh, shootings in Fulini for example six people were shot uh, dead on three different i think if i'm correct three different incidents that happened from uh, just after one until uh, uh, later in the in the in the in the evening now what is really our responsiveness if if we're saying we have because i seem fully is also part of the stations that are identified in terms of your anti-gang unit strategy but if there are people who are going to be shot uh, at one, and one assumes that these killings might be a, 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 a gang related. Uh, that's just an assumption from an untrained uh, me. Uh, but I'm saying uh, if that happens, but what is our responsiveness such that so many other people uh, lose their lives uh, and again to unknown suspects? Uh, uh, are we doing the right things? Do we have? I understand and appreciate the answer from the acting commissioner in terms of the safer um, uh, cities, the smart cities. But what is it that we can do now with the resources that we are, we, we are using now? If if thousand, let me make an example. If thousand boats are not going to assist us in being able to detect and 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 identify these criminals immediately. Uh, 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 how how do we think? Are we looking at other ways of uh, really uh, 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 using these these funds? And to docs, I want to understand: is there a plan? If these CCTV cameras really they they they, they work, is there is there a plan of rolling out more CCTV cameras in these particular stations? Because the safety plan that the department speaks about it speaks about halving the meter rate uh, in ten years. And, and and now you might find that we are on the second year and we're still establishing structures and in some instances we have made a rate uh, 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 increasing like like in the in the in the uh, as I cited uh, yesterday so so I want to I want to check if are we are we really doing the right things and what is uh, uh, our our response and and we appreciate really chair the honestly and note the the, some of the points that were made uh, from the subsidiary. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much, Member Kama. I now note Member 
Peter Marie for his two minute question or input or clarification. I note you, Member Peter Marie. Are you still online, sir? I am online. I'm sorry, I just coughed a bit. <laughs> I want to first compliment the, the hard working efforts of the police. They're doing very everything in their power to to combat crime. But we also know the impact <coughs> by poor prosecutions. They're being hampered by cases being lost because the cases presented was not considered evidence enough to convict. What cooperation is there between the police and the prosecutor? <coughs> Can that be improved? In the American system, the prosecutors are very much involved in investigation, especially murder and rape. Am I correct when I say that here the police does its work, folders get lost, poor evidence is given to prosecutors, and criminals walk free because some cops can be bribed. Do we need an internal investigation, a watchdog over police? Isn't it time that the police have their own watchdog to watch their own members? Who some of them, <laughs> some of them are prone to be bribed. Dockets get lost. That's my first question. Secondly, how well are police detectives trained? Where do they receive their training? Are they tech? <laughs> Not <laughs> I'm so sorry, I apologize. I have a bit of a cough here. Uh, are our investigators fully prepared to investigate such intricate murder cases, robberies, hijackings? What type of people are recruited to be police? Is the recruiting system so that you don't get scholars that become police later on, and they have friends in a, among gangsters. So they become a policeman to protect gangsters and to warn gangsters and not to convict gangsters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Member Marie. We trust that you will feel your usual self as soon as possible. Thank you for your attendance. If you can lower your hand at this time in order for, thank you. Um, based on my follow-up questions I've made, um, thank you um, for the answers. Thank you that there will be um, additional requests that will be uh, provided to the committee in writing regarding um, drug houses, uh, but also for the frank and open answer regarding um, the DNA, because it speaks directly to slide number seven, and I've listened to General Viri, and it is concerning. So from our side, um, to put the offer, not the offer, to put it on the table if we are able to get information on the, on the use of private labs in order to assist in this regard, um, to expedite cases, um, have we done um, an assessment regarding the feasibility um, of such, as well as what is the validity thereof? Um, should private laboratories be used in order to um, compensate for the FSL that is currently experiencing tremendous strain and pressure? My second uh, question is regarding the... Um, the detective's workload, um, the last time we've, we've heard, uh, it was excessive. Can we get an update in that regard? Um, because it ties indirectly to 
to the work and the questions posed by member um, McKenzie as well. And um, I appreciate, Commissioner, our engagement today. And I appreciate that we have, and if you can state that we have a commitment that SAPs will be rid of corruption. Um, I know it's going to be extremely difficult, but if I consider the input earlier on with regard to the um, the firearm, the central firearm registry, um, it it is concerning to many residents and in building trust um, between the very institutions that's supposed to help and, and keep us safe, um, we do commend um, such officers for their hard work and for their dedication. I can I can imagine it must be difficult, but just to hear your views on on that as well. But thank you so much. I feel I'm I'm covered in terms of the follow up questions. And one follow up question, uh, General Mangi, if I can, in terms of the guns, you've stated earlier on that firearms were taken. We've heard an alarming report in a Nova Park where a gun was taken from a suspect and, and it received wide media coverage. I'm not going to repeat all the details here, uh, but it received media coverage. Um, have we done, and am I thinking too, too big that we could potentially have um, an incineration in the Western Cape for drugs to be destroyed in the Western Cape and for guns to be destroyed in the Western Cape? Or is that not an option at all, considering that if guns or drugs are transported to be to another province to be um, to be destroyed, um, knowing that there is potential corrupt elements that could make that those guns or drugs land back in the very arms which it has been confiscated from, is that at all an option? And the views um, from SEPS um, in that regard. Thank you so much. I'll hand over to SEPS and then again to the city of Cape Town and to Docs if there's any replies in that order. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I will start, but most of the things they go towards uh, detection. But let me start with the last one of the of the possibility of destroying the, the, the firearms here. Um, I think it's been on the card, but we can just respond to what, what is the National Commission is saying on that. It's been suggestions which has been worked through for us for years now. Uh, but as it stands now, we're sending them to national. But we we, we just make a follow up and, and submit that in writing as well, sir. And and secondly, the the issue of the private labs uh, and 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 the forensic lab, our forensic lab. Uh, there has been since last week a uh, the, the, a money that was sourced for for the next four months to 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 address the backlog. Um, uh, which when I was spoke, speaking to the division commissioner, that then the labs are starting now, especially the one that the most ex uh, highly technological equipped, the one here in, in Western Cape, that uh, it, there's reasonable to the possibility that within this next four months, we will cover a lot of uh, the backlog that we had on the other issues on the forensic, like your, your, your touch DNAs and, and, and uh, especially on the crimes against women and children. Then the private labs, they're not, it's not an, it's, an, it's not something that has not been used in the, in, 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 it's just a question of then getting assistance from the national committee. And I know that uh, with our engagement uh, between our, uh, uh, the office of the provincial commission and then the MEC uh, uh, for community safety, that there's, there's been that offer which we've requested that if it has been done, it must go through the channels of a donation that we do in the police and then goes the same thing we, and police indicated that they won't be saying no but it must go in terms of the donation police that we have as as it, it, if it has to be done now as far as co coordination is concerned that question we've answered and i've answered the question to say some cases they take long it's a project that takes more than five years from to, to finalize. 
But in that fine five years, you got all uh, your SARS, you got all other people. But if you see maybe one of the gangsters is still not being attached, it doesn't mean that there isn't work that's been done. But it's it's some it's a, it's a question that it takes time to to get there to to do some investigations. So there there is a coordination on that part. And uh, uh, Robbie, Mr. Robbie Robert has indicated that in the prof joints in our joints coordination. We have some priority committees that work on many things, and in a, in a form of the organized crime, then it's, it's a different story that we work on with other road players, the, the law enforcement you, that we talked about. There, there is coordination. It's not a question that there's no coordination, but it does take time. But you can see on, in many of those that have already been done, where the assets we have went to court to freeze some assets in, elsewhere, maybe not in, in, in the near future, yet in the most recent in the Western Cape, but it's been done more often that that's happening. That's a coordination that is there. It's there nationally and also at the at, at the, the provincial level. Then I would then ask Wood General Vary to to take us through on the most questions that talk to investigation, the training, and the conviction rate of those that you arrest. And I must just want to say before I give it to him. Weekly, the prevalence of firearms on the streets. We are seizing about 30 to 35 firearms weekly from on the streets. And that in itself then tells us that it's not only the firearms that are coming from the, the police, but the firearms that have been lost mostly now by, by many people. And many of the firearms that we found, they are their numbers are filed often, takes time to to take them for etching and to come back maybe after a year to say this was the original number of that firearm. Then we would be able to determine where it comes from. Then you share over to you, General Billy. I think I'm going to be, yes, I'll deal with the shortages first, the training and the, the cooperation with the prosecutors, the workload and all of those things. I'll start with the workload issue as simple. The workload will always be a challenge. Firstly, if you look at the structure of any police all over the world, the detectives are the fewest compared to the visible side of the police. Uh, but it's a reality where the workload of the detectives is not controlled by themselves, but controlled by the public who commits the crimes. Now, one of the challenges that we do have, and it will always be with us, in the absence of consideration about urban expansion and development and where things are going. I always mention the example of how Makaza emerged when General Jacobs and myself were standing on a hill uh, about 15 years ago and only two shacks were built. And then General Mondisa told us if we come back three days after this, there will be 20 and by Two weeks later, there will be a whole township. Now, that is literally what happened. And I want to explain what spatial, what, what urbanization means. And we are not able to often adjust our amount of, we weren't able to adjust the amount of detectives correspondently with the growth of, for example, an area like Kelsey's River. It is not a closed area like Cape Town you know, or, or Claremont for that matter, where spatial growth might be limited. The same applies with, 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 with businesses, business expansion. We have a range of new dockets that comes with a new mall. We have shop liftings, we have assaults, we have robberies on the routes, we have taxi conflict, all of those things. These things are not controlled by us. So I think, realistically speaking, yeah, we will never be able to, to, to meet the need that is coming to there. But in terms of the way we work, uh, we obviously prioritize, you see, and that is reflected in the way we structured firstly, certain crimes against women and children through the FCS, the specialized units uh, uh, are being built. We are bringing back murder and robbery. We are bringing back the taxi violence unit. We are bringing back we have specialized drug units and we're expanding these capabilities with the signing off of the new structure already in two years ago. It is now an implementation stage. So as from the 1st of April this year, 
it will be system systematized and institutionalized in the South African Police Service. So that though that is a welcome return, it was part of prioritization, the specialization part deals with it. Otherwise, we are just an amorphous detective branch that takes whatever comes across our across our thing. So that one thing is being corrected structurally. The issue of training. Oh, let, need I say yeah, that our detective training is world accredited. Some people are quite a, even the London Metropolitan, even those those institutions and the FBI regard our training as of an extremely high standard. The question is with all of that training, it's so whether you can handle the workload. And that, but that be that as may with COVID, we suffered eventually because all our annual training, sometimes three, four, four times a year, it had to be cancelled because unfortunately we cannot do this online. You know, these trainings, very practical orientated people working teams, they get tested on scenes, simulated or live. They actually visit courts where they get practical experience and it's a continuous process and it could not be maintained due to COVID. So that is that is the one thing. When it comes to the practical part of the trade craft, um, but that is a world phenomenon. It's happened. You can go to other countries. It's also happened in the same way. Um, the issue that was asked about, there was once again about the destruction of firearms and the challenge around firearms and overpark firearm. Let me say, I, that was the case I was not going to come to. It's the same Prince Lou modus operandi. The thing went into a store up it to the highest level where it was supposed to be destroyed and they can only be destroyed in Pretoria by the Silverton store. And um, in that particular case, uh, the firearm found its way there. It's exactly the same modus operandi. Um, we were well aware that when we investigated Prince Lou and Naidu and all of these other people, that other syndicates were also up operative within the South African police around those particular stores. So it was just a matter of as needing to still sort out the other people who was the other Prince Luzu was still on the thing. So that is a challenge. Um, I think this matter is part of the new, there's some debates in parliament or that, and I think at a political level, you people will sort out what is the probable option. But suffice it to say, there's a need to study different models of other countries. We are one of the few countries where we license all firearms a policing as a policing institution where we store where we destroy firearms as a policing institution and perhaps uh, the correction of this problem given its recurrence from the 1970s already i should put it like that with some of the cases we're picking up that it perhaps it's time to look at the institutional architecture of the way firearms are licensed and its links to policing in the in particular but that is not my Forte, that is a policy issue for your level. In terms of the cooperation with police and prosecutions, yes. I mean, our dockets get presented to them on high flyer cases and some more complex cases. We consult with them while we are busy with the investigation. So the model that you see in the Hawks is not unique to the Hawks, but you will understand our scale and caseload is much higher and perhaps the challenge comes in the availability for the scale and scope of the work compared to the Hawks. The Hawks has a very few cases. They cherry, they can pick what they take. We can't pick. We take everything. So those are some of the, the particular challenge. But where we have specialized courts, it does work, like with the crimes against women and children, with the domestic violence courts. It does expedite the, 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 the movement of cases through there in that um, on the issue of convictions, let us be clear that cases fail despite how well they've been investigated and well presented in court, because there's a human element. There's such a thing as witnesses who can get bribed and get paid. And besides, if they're not bribed and paid, they can often make mistakes in the testimony that raise questions their credibility and those are the results it falls. So cases fall for those reasons. Cases collapse for technical reasons like I've referred to evidence management and those kind of issues that present a challenge 
that delays a particular case in court. Like a DNA sample, for example, if, if it's not available, we can't prove that you did it, except by elaborate witness testimony, which becomes also another another challenge in terms of the integer, how well witnesses perform in court. But objective uh, proof becomes very challenging when we are sitting with challenges of those things. But like I said, it's not unique to ourselves. Um, I'm sure you are aware of the London Metropolitan Police example where over 200,000 case dockers disappeared overnight. So those are the kind of challenges, not physically, but as given the electronic architecture, which is similar to what we have, by the way, in the e-docket system. So those are challenges that also have compound the problem of, of how fast cases go through court and whether we get convictions. It's not often uh, availability of dockets and those things. But on the availability of case dockets in court, um, if those lists could be provided to us, I'll go and individually check on each of the case dockets, as we usually do in the feedback to the to the to the, the watching brief to you guys. You just give us the list, we'll go through it, and we'll give you clear answers as to what happened on the specific day your monitors might have been in court. The recent shoots, shootings in Mfoleni, I don't want to go into too much detail, but we have people in the visor there uh, for both. But we'll leave it as it as it is there. But the case in Fuleni, and as we find increasing Kailicha and all of these players, requires that we really relook at the way we think about gangs and thinking about it as only people with their front teeth out and walking in a certain way in Manama. So those kind of things, but the gang unit is well positioned to, 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 to look at those things further. Gang investigations, we've increased the team. We've, we've also add greater specialization that will come with a new structure or in the SEPs, uh, where they will be part of the provincial uh, organized crime component in the future. Thank you. Is there still additional you are covered. Uh, members, um, that is the part for SAPs. We are going to do one further round um, for follow-up questions. I am aware of the time. It is now 11.47. Um, um, General Vieri, thank you for that. Um, I am aware that the case dockets and the reference numbers were sent already and that the reply is due on or before the end of April. Um, so that will be circulated um, based on member McKenzie's question regarding the court watching brief. Once that is tabled um, with the committee, we will then deal with that. I will note the city of Cape Town and then docs for the second round. But then, members, I will allow for one and a half minutes for the last round in this regard. We are aware of the time. Um, as we were sitting here, I got a message that someone that there were shootings happening in Lavender Hill again, um, which we already expedited and sent over to SAPS. Hence, the work will continue even if we are not seated like this. I will now note the City of Cape Town to briefly in terms of the questions regarding the second round follow-up and then for the department. Chairman, Chairman, thank you. Uh, although most of the questions were directed to the South African Police Services, I can maybe just comment in terms of uh, 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 Mr. Bosman um, with regarding to, to, to the technology. Uh, the city of Cape Town is currently uh, also uh, looking at the utilization of drones uh, in our own environment and how we can assist uh, with regarding to uh, in terms of drones with operations. And then we are also uh, utilizing currently the emergency policing incident uh, coordination device that is a cell phone device that is issued to each of our members uh, when they are out in the field and they are receiving all the complaints uh, on their device and should they attend any incident or any crime scene 
or make any arrest or whatsoever, they load up uh, the pictures and the uh, videos uh, of that particular scene up onto the system. And uh, that is for download purposes available uh, to the South African police as well. Uh, then just with regarding to Speaker Kaba, uh, again, what can we do? What what uh, what are we doing about Mfilani at the moment with the six people that died over the weekend? What is our responsiveness uh, from the city of Cape Town? And uh, with regarding to docs, myself and uh, General Barnett they had a meeting yesterday or a discussion yesterday uh, with regarding to Mfilani, and we are looking at urgent interventions. Uh, in terms of leap deployment to that particular area. Uh, I just made contact during the feedback session of the SAP uh, with my uh, CCTV surveillance operator. And uh, there was an indication that we've got only one camera currently in the Mfilene area. And due to the fact that Mfilene is one of the seven priority areas within of the 30 nationally, I also indicated to him that we need to apply for more funding uh, in the new financial year uh, to roll out more uh, CCTV cameras in that area or to approach our ward councillor uh, with regarding to funding that is made available to, to the ward councillors in order to see if he can make any funding available for more CCTV cameras in that particular area. Then just Speaker Marie, uh, with regarding to, to feedback, in terms of the recruitment of any law enforcement officers, um, we are uh, going through a system ourselves with the law enforcement officers to look at their criminal record, uh, uh, to take fingerprints, set our, uh, uh, those fingerprints are sent to SAPS to, to see if there's any criminal record. Uh, uh, then uh, the second uh, part of it is SAP signed an appointment certificate uh, and during that particular point, signing of that appointment certificate, there's another uh, 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 scrutiny of uh, the member itself, again, with regarding to criminal records. And at the end of the day, that is how we are making sure that no criminals end up in, in our system. Thank you. Thank you, Director Roberts. Can I just double check, um, HOD, is there any comment from you, Advocate Pillay? Um, yes, um, honorable yes, honorable chair. Would like to would like to respond, We in terms of terms of CC cameras, CC cameras, we are we are liaising with the from the use of the technology in general, and specifically cameras. We can't we can't hear them. Advocate Pillay, can you give it another try? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Oh, that sounds better. Thank you. Um, so in relation to the CCTV uh, cameras, the follow-up question by Honorable Member Karma, we are currently liaising with the SAPs, as I indicated, on the use of technology in general, but then also specifically in relation to uh, cameras. Um, also, our area-based teams, once uh, fully established, will also be advising on the interventions that are required in a specific area to address the challenges that are faced. Uh, this will be based on evidence and data led. So we will be informed by the teams on the ground of what um, initiatives and technology would be required to be put in place uh, to support that specific area as it relates to the Commission of Crime. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, HOD. I note the Acting Provincial Commissioner. Chair, sure, thank you. The only question that we did answer, we did not answer, is whether we own CCTV cameras as a base. The answer is no. We are partnering with the city. Uh, our, ours is to look, look at where the cameras could be, advise where the cameras could be in our hotspot areas. And, and also the issue that uh, the city is looking at, we are encouraging that one, the use of drones, because it would, it would it assist us in as far as getting there faster than we could with, with, with the use of drones. Uh, but that, that would need also a certain specialties in the, in the fusion center or NEF centers where they're going to be managed from. 
Daniel Chair. Thank you so much. Members, it is now 11.54. We will take a last round of questions. Chairperson, on a point of order. I note you, Member Bosman. Sorry, Chairperson, I'm not sure if you're able to see my hand in the chamber. It's been up for a while. And I, I thank the Provincial Commissioner for getting to one of my follow-up questions. And I'm also very grateful uh, to the uh, Community Safety Department and Director Roberts from the city um, for attempting to answer from their part. But that, uh, the, some of the questions that were specifically aimed at SAPS were not answered. And the General just answered the last one around the technology that SAPS owns. And the second part of that question was, what confidence should we have as a committee and what confidence should members of the public have in the South African Police Service to manage any of these tools if they do acquire it? And then the second question was, what is the capacity within the South African Police Service and specifically the capacity within crime intelligence um, to actually analyze, um, interrogate and um, cat um, categorize the information that is coming from CCTV footage, whether it is from cameras that belongs to a local municipality, through a provincial sphere of government, or through private companies such as the private security industry. Um, my, that's my the, the question that I really need answers to, Chair, because we know that there are many hardworking SAPS members, but we also know that SAPS is facing a massive um, human resource crisis due to the fiscal constraints and issues related to corruption within the police service. Member Bosman, thank you so much. Um, that question will be answered by the South African Police Service, but may I request there is two additional hands, and then you take that question um, in conjunction with Member Bosman's um, question. I see Member Mare and Member McKenzie, and if members can, after they have asked their questions, lower their hand, please. I see Member Mare. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chair. Chair, the thing is just what but battles me is perhaps General Viri can answer. There were landmark court judgments about belonging to a gang. And once you are convicted of belonging to a gang, then membership of that gang becomes illegal. This was already in 2005. So I want to know how many of these gangs that operate in the Western Cape has, because of the law and that uh, landmark court judgment, how many of these gangs have been declared illegal? They can't recruit, you can't belong to them, and you can be jailed just for being a member of the gang. You don't have to be convicted of a crime. How many of these gangs can the police tell me have they caught a person belonging to a gang, either because he wears the chappies of a gang or because he is known to be a member of a gang and has been sentenced? And now, as you know, that he can be sentenced for up to eight years just to be, for belonging to a gang. The second one is there's been a lot of police killings, and it hurts me to think police are becoming now the target of the very gangs they should wipe out. Now, do you think that the courts are too lenient or the law is too lenient in sentencing people convicted of killing policemen? To kill a policeman is terrorism because you act against the state. And then, do you think police should stay in crime-ridden areas or should you have police villages where police can be safe and they live there instead of letting a man who's supposed to investigate a crime in Manenberg or Bontevo, he also lives there. How do you expect him to act against the gang in Bontevo if he must live and stay there? Shouldn't we have police villages? And lastly, when you do screen police recruits, do you take in consideration petty crimes? Or are you just looking whether he murdered somebody? If he was committed of a petty crime, were you okay in becoming a member of the cops? Because petty crime lead to more serious crimes. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Member Maria. I'm glad that you are already feeling a bit better. I now see Member McKenzie. <laughs> thank you, Chair. <Chip. laughs> I laugh at your comment. Um, thank you for the, the answers earlier on. Chair, two things I'd just like to, to raise in the last uh, point. Uh, earlier on, I, we heard that the, the hampering of the delivery of service in the Western Cape was because of national supply chain. And perhaps I didn't ask the, the, the question, and that's why our colleagues could not respond. Um, is there a suggestion if some of these services, procurement services, are being transferred to provinces? And here I'm talking about SAP specifically, into SAPs, not any other. Uh, uh, so if this service, particularly when, when we issue now, uh, currently will be improved. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and then the second question, I'd just like to add one from the city and one from the SAPs. What laws in the Western Cape, particularly Western Cape, prevents them from doing their job effectively? And what should we as lawmakers change to strengthen their hand to ensure that they do their jobs effectively? That is to SAPs and to the city of Cape Town. And then the last question, Chair, who is the head of crime intelligence in the Western Cape? Because I know it was General v uh, Jacobs at some point, then he left to National. But who is the head of crime intelligence in the Western Cape? Thank you. Thank you, Member McKenzie. I see Member Bueta. Thank you, Chairperson. Chair, I just want to check in regard to the informers. Um, how many informers um, have re detracted from being such? And what are some of the reasons that they pose why they do not or cannot do it any longer? And have there been any threats or have informers lost their lives or been um, maimed? And how did SAPS um, handle this? Um, also, the other question that I want to know, Chair, and I want to know from SAPS, as we are currently getting this presentation, um, what are, how many um, SAPS members or are under investigation, has been suspended, or have cases pending against them for colluding with gangsters. Thank you. Thank you, Member Bota. I see Member Christians as the last hand raised in this regard. Directly thereafter, I will request members to lower their hand. Member Christians. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, um, just, uh, uh, just, just. Uh, when we when we um, visited police stations, you know, um, the, uh, um, there were police stations um, that one vehicle is in the repairs and the other vehicle is out in the road. There was quite a number of vehicles that had to be repaired, um, you know, and then there's no substitute uh, vehicles going out. So, so if we can just get about, you know, um, vehicles patrolling areas, police stations, and we also know that certain police stations are vulnerable where, you know, uh, uh, gangsters come and target certain police stations. Uh, are there vulnerable police, and not the names, but, uh, you know, are they addressing the vulnerable police stations and also the personnel at uh, vulnerable police stations, not just the precinct itself, but also um, staff being, uh, police people being uh, sick, you know, and there's only one person on 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 the uh, uh, on duty. So just uh, you know, I'm just talking about police vulnerability and the effectiveness. We have the vehicles, but it stays in repairs. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Member Christians. That appears to be the last follow-up um, and additional questions from members with regard to today's activities. Um, if I can just add. To the questions in terms of, um, and there's been some media reports regarding Operation Lockdown 2. Um, I have submitted uh, parliamentary questions in that regard, um, but if we are able to 
ascertain the amount of additional staff um, that has been added to the current complement, what that amount is, and do we foresee them staying in the province beyond the end of April or beyond the additional deployment? And if SEPS could speak to the fact that um, if we have a situation where, where, where gang fights are flaring up and we get additional SEPS in, but then they just leave again. Um, if SEPS can speak to that for uh, for how long um, are we addressing uh, from a PC side? Um, is this being addressed in terms of under-resourcing? Um, is it being addressed with national? Um, if SEPS could speak to that, uh, but I see that many of the other matters will be sent via further um, written communication uh, because my questions in that regard um, was rather detailed in terms of the members coming and staying and cost involved. Thank you so much. Over to Seps. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the last question, we, may we then submit in writing, sir? Acting PC, please forgive me. I see one hand went up. Um, Mr. Bosman, is that a point of order? No, Chairperson, I was unaware that you were doing the final round of questions, and I wanted your indulgence if I could um, sneak in one more, please. You may go ahead, sir. Thank you, Chairperson. Chair, what I'd like to know from SAPS is, um, I heard earlier, and I'm not sure if it was um, General Lincoln or General Vieri, but they were saying that the um, South African Police Service it has now um, completed its reorganization of the structure and that a, a, the new organogram in terms of how it operates is currently being implemented. And I just wanted to ask whether the um, changes include changes in terms of how the provincial police um, in the Western Cape or provincially will be interacting with uh, SAPs nationally. Um, because from what I'm hearing today, it sounds very much that there are certain functions that are operated and controlled from a provincial uh, perspective. And then there are key functions that are transversal in nature and transversal in its application, such as the forensic uh, science laboratory, um, the uh, destruction and the uh, cataloging of firearms and drugs that seem to be nationally controlled. So are there the serious conversations about whether these are going to be moving down to a pro provincial level? And does that fit into the, um, the envisaged um, priorities that this Western Cape government has set in terms of creating a provincial police service? Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Member Bosman. Members, I will allow the Department of Community Safety City as well as SAPS to reply to the questions. Uh, thereafter, I will encourage members to make use of the resolution stage of this committee meeting where we are able to obtain additional information as well as your parliamentary privileges in terms of written and oral questions. I will note the South African Police Service firstly, thereafter um, the City of Cape Town and then docs for any additional comments. And then we will then conclude at that stage to deal with our committee business before we take a five-minute comfort break before we deal with our committee business. But members, thank you for the engagement. We have always been open in this committee. And to SEPs as well as the city and to DOCS is to foster those valuable inputs and to foster robust debate and to have that engagement. So if there is a pertinent question that one member is needing to get off his or her chest directly year after, we will then potentially accommodate it. But please, members, like I've indicated, we have other parliamentary privileges. But I now note the PC. Thank you, Chair. We will share the answers, but I will start with the few answers. The first one, restructuring. Restructuring means restructuring, but does not mean that other functions that are nationally held will be devolved down to, 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 to the provinces. Uh, we are a national component, and that's where we are. 
And as far as the provincial uh, policy is concerned, I'm not aware of it. I, I, I would want to be to to be engaging on that part. We we are a national component. We are the main national policing in as provided in the constitution of the country. Lockdown two, we will then submit the 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 in writing the numbers. Uh, although we would have wanted to mention the numbers, but for security reasons, we will not, but we would submit that. Uh, however, it will go beyond, I may, I may just say it will go beyond April. It will be going at least far beyond April, but we will submit that in writing, say. So. Oh, the stations visited, and there is one vehicle, and uh, sometimes, yes, that is true. We cannot deny that it, it happens. It was the garages. And you may also recall that uh, during lockdown, many of the commercial garages were closed. So they were not working. So we were only using our garages and some of the things which we now were looking at, sending some of the out to be repaired where the workload is up, is high. And that's been a standard. It's been a standard procedure for all the years. If we, our garages are full, then we take it to the commercial garages to, to do what they could. But then uh, we, we, it's been worked out to uh, another way that we'll be re redesigning uh, ourselves to, to capacitate our own garages with stock of repairs, parts, and everything that we have not been doing for uh, some time. So that's that's. To, to come closer to the, the time, the spend that a, a car or a vehicle stays in the garage. And as far as the, the absenteeism is concerned, we also admit that it, COVID has also affected us in a big time. But we do what we have with we, the cluster commanders and, and, and ours, just we redirect resources where, where we, we could uh, uh, cover the parts or getting the people that are on rest days to come and work. Mm -hmm. And also other volunteers and the special reservists that are also assisting us a big time. Now, in as far as we, when there is a flare or an upset of, of uh, gang violence, we've got to stabilize it. Once we then stabilize it, then we, we move out that stabilization to stabilize elsewhere. But then the normalization period takes place, normal policing in that, in that environment. So that's why you would see that, uh, let's say, for example, Mr. Plain, we deployed so many people. Now, all of a sudden, the scale, we scale down because we've normalized, and now we're getting elsewhere. For example, what happened in Fulham needs also an attention. So it's a, it's a question that uh, reprioritizing and redirecting resources to, to stabilize the situation, and then normal policy continues. Now, uh, the question is, there was a question of, of the number of police officers and and the population it's it's an it's an it's a debate that we've been looking at all of us and in, in, in the police and looking at in any way we can't model it with any other country because we're different as south africa so it's a question that even we spend most of the time looking at do we look at what we have or do we look at the crime do we look at as general Vera was saying the sporadic, like now we got COVID-19 uh, extensions in Mfulani. That's a that's whole settlement. Now, if we keep up with that and then looking at the population, then 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 it's difficult to say what is the the, the norm, our own norm in South Africa. We've got to create our own norms given all these situations that that we're sitting with, and then. Uh, can I then ask General Vera to answer on other issues and then General Lincoln and General Mangi, and then we finish there. Okay, I'll, I'll deal with the question that was asked by Honorable Marais around the gang membership issue. Firstly, let me deal with court experience here on this issue of poker. In particular, section is section 11 that deals with how we prove membership. Now, in all the cases that we've dealt with so far in the Western Cape, we must first prove that the gang we're bringing is a criminal gang. 
So it's not enough to say it's a gang. You must prove it's a criminal gang. And if you are proving it's a criminal gang, you must improve that there are criminal activities associated with that gang historically. Uh, it's fairly easy when you're dealing with gangs that exist for 200 years, like the 28s, the 26, 27s, with a declared mission where the declared mission is crime. Okay? It's in their code, it's fairly established historically. But when you're dealing with what we dealt with in our first gang case, the fancy boys in Atlantis, when we took the whole leadership down, they argued that they were not a criminal gang, that they were a group of boys hanging out together, calling themselves the fancy boys. We had to go and counter prove that with the history of what our operations proved. So that's the first thing. Now, once we cross that threshold, we have our series of offenses. We have proved that you're a criminal gang. Now, the court expects of us to, to prove about five things amongst others. And the way is prescribed as to how we should prove it. It says in section 11 under A, if the person admits to criminal gang membership, it's fairly straightforward. Under B, it says, if it's identified, if it's he or she is identified by a member of the fam, parent or guardian, it's fairly straightforward, which is one that we've never had in our poker cases, by the way. Uh, if the C resides or frequents, in, frequents a particular criminal gang's areas and adopts their style of dress, their hand signs, their language or code statute and associates with whom the members of the criminal gang are known to be associated with. In that particular case, it depends on observation that is measured over a long period of time. And we use in the police the gang card system where every time they contact, the police has contact and identifies in that company, it assists us with a proof of section C, of subsection C. D has been arrested more than once in the company of identified leaders of a criminal gang which are consistent with the usual criminal. If general, if the AGU goes to Menenberg and sees constantly A in the company of the HLs, arrests them constantly, then that association weighs strongly in terms of the element of proof. And the last one is identified as a member of a criminal gang by physical evidence such as photographs and documentation. And this is the most challenging one in any court. Because you might have, when you were 13, 12 years old, decided to TJ tattoo it on your own because you were at school and you want to identify but weren't a member. But 20 years down the line, we can't take you. We can't use that as a criteria to brief. We've had challenges from Geweld in the case where we studied and presented evidence on his old tattoos. And he was saying precisely those are old tattoos. So the freshness of the tattoos and all these things must be proven because in the Cape Flats, many people have tattoos of gangs. So it, you must prove that the person is that now at this historical time. So those are some of the complexities, Honorable Maria, that goes into it. But it's not a simple matter of going to going, going out in, with a nyala and starting in one point of Manenberg and picking up everybody who calls themselves a HL or who we think is an HL. We must go through very specific sets of proof. It is a long range collection of evidence. So operations at the AGU mounts where it constantly hits places is actually a form of intelligence collection also for us to actually get those elements that we are required to prove correct. So that is the challenge on terms of uh, the gang offenses. Um, even with the judgments, you still have to prove it's a criminal gang and you still have to prove link criminal activity to the individual member that you, of that criminal gang that you are picking up. Is, I think that was the only thing on detectives. I just want to make sure. Shannon? It's a question about who's the head of crime intelligence, Major General Tio is the head of crime intelligence. Do we have intelligence capacity analysis? The answer, yes, we have that capability. We will add it all the time. And this is where we're coming all with, with all the other issues where we identify 
oh, it's, 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 it's an intelligent different. Our approach, our operations are mostly intelligent driven. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, General. Uh, it will be the question of uh, on 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 the laws or policies. Uh, our murders are co co committed by firearms and dangerous weapons. But on the side of dangerous weapons, uh, we 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 struggle because these cases are not prosecuted because the prosecutors are looking at it from another perspective. So it. But but it is a reality. If we we don't stop and search and take knives and uh, from the people, they they rob the people, and they stab and kill the people. We're talking about the pe people who carry knives in the streets, leading to robberies, uh, leading to murders, uh, in 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 our situation. So that's where we need to be assisted by policymakers. Then also the other one is the confiscation of liquor. We have to confiscate liquor as f when it comes to ship beans. We're talking about illegal traders of liquor, what we call ship beans. Now it's labor intensive to take liquor from a ship bean. It's, it's labor intensive. And then we book it in. Uh, the case goes to court. We manage the case. Now if, we, we, if it must be returned back to the to the Shibina, then also we moving around in cycles there. So we want that liquor to be, it must be disposed of. It must not go back to 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 the Shibina, so that these Shibins can be closed down. Uh, if they want to trade, then they should they should become taverners, and then they they can fall under compliance. So that's an area that we request to be looked at because we need a breakthrough there. Lastly, when you come to domestic violence and uh, gender-based violence, domestic violence, you find that uh, in our country, the victim, the victim is the one that must look for alternative accommodation or maybe go to relatives. And then we, the police, then uh, uh, can escort the victim out of the house to relatives and the perpetrator will remain in the house. We saw in Germany uh, that uh, it is another way around. The police officer, if you come to that house and see that uh, even this person is even violent to them, that police officer has a right to, to, to issue the order to say, leave this place for 10 days. The police officer, the constable are authorized in Germany to leave. But here in our country, it's the other way around. It's the victim that we we are obligated to assist. We can escort her to another place if there's relatives. So that is what we maybe can be looked at because it shouldn't be that way. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairperson. <clears throat> Chair, the last question was, I think it was Honorable Maria, if I'm not mistaken. Must the police stay with in the gang infested areas or should they we not look at uh, police uh, villages or uh, police estates that is the thinking of the of the nurse uh, of them police management at this stage and uh, the last engagement was uh, two weeks ago on this issue that uh, well, uh, there's a challenge that we need to each province that uh, could find land, must must then inform the National Commission how that is going to manifest itself. I'm not sure it's going to be private-public partnership, but ideally that is the thinking we have that our members should stay away from, look, we created this before. We integrated our members to the community from the barracks and thinking then now, the, the attacks and the threats on our members where they stay, uh, now it, it, it makes them uh, unable to a great extent to perform duties in those areas. So 
the the most now that we've the management has to, has decided to do is to we agree that the way to go is to have police villages or police estates where you would have police members and other uh, law enforcement agents staying together in the same area and most probably that would also have another impact because you would need schools you would need uh, the proximity of everything which I'm not sure then what would be, but we appeal is that, yes, we agree. We need to have look after our members, ensure that they stay in, in the areas where they can, because at this stage, most of our members, they don't qualify to get RDP houses. They're not qualifying to get, they're not in the upper brackets to, to buy, to get loans to buy houses in the areas where they could so the, the most appropriate option is to have these police villages or police estates, and that that is the, that is the way to go. And uh, I think we would be engaging also to find if in the Western Cape there is a place that you could within the proximity because it must also be centralised. If I'm working in Kailich, I'm working in Musenberg or anywhere else, I'm able to go. So so without being influence so we're looking into, into those things and I think that is it that is the way that we we also looked at thank you chair director is there any comments from you chair I can just comment on uh, speaker Marie uh, in terms of his input um, I think with regarding to the input uh, given by general Billy the National Prosecuting Authority. He was the one who, who went out to train everybody and uh, at the police stations and that sort of thing in, in terms of the Poker Act and uh, with regarding to, to the identification of gangs. And I, I think we should build on, on that particular issue. And I, I think I, I see a vacuum currently in our integrated environment. And I, see, I, I think we should look at that. Uh, then with regarding to the... Uh, against committing petting crimes that is part of our enforcement uh, that uh, and my instruction was to to our operational people within the gang and drug task team operating with the anti-gang unit that uh, we should uh, enforce the bylaws should it be in terms of uh, uh, traffic uh, fines should it be in terms of bylaw fines uh, should it be outstanding warrants on any bylaw or traffic fines we can always address the, the petty crime in terms of, of the gangs. Then uh, just with regarding to Speaker McKenzie, the question was, uh, are there any laws preventing the city and the police for doing their job? Uh, uh, Speaker Murray, I, I don't think the question is not what, uh, what acts are prevented uh, to do our job. I think the answer is, how do we apply these acts uh, uh, in terms of the threats, if we are looking at the gangs, uh, go and check what sort of acts are there and how do we really apply these acts with regarding to our operational approach. The same is applicable to the transport environment, uh, the, uh, the, the extortion, corruption, gender-based violence. Uh, we should actually go and see what sort of acts are available to enforce and how do the acts support us uh, with regarding to this crime. Uh, in terms of the, the uh, speaker, both uh, Christians and, and the chair yourself and Bosman, it was all sub-related issues. Thank you. Advocate Pele, is there any comment from the department? Uh, uh, thank you, Honorable, thank you, Honorable chair. chair. I will try to be brief. Um, the Department of Community Safety continues to exercise our oversight mandate over the SAPs and the Municipal Police Services. However, our oversight and holding the various entities accountable does not preclude us from working collaboratively with each other. So I would like to reiterate our appreciation to the SAPs under the leadership of the Acting PC and the City for a high level of collaboration uh, engagement and mutual trust, which I think is evident in the presentations and feedback this morning. 
Um, it did not happen overnight, but due to the commitment of all, we have been able to get where we are now. We are also looking forward to the finalization of the appointment of a uh, provincial commissioner in the Western Cape to ensure uh, stability in the province. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Advocate Pillay. Members, it is now 12.29. In terms of the way forward, we have concluded our engagement with the South African Police Service with the City of Cape Town Safety and Security Directorate, as well as the Department of Community Safety. Um, in our committee business, there will be um, there will be a request for information, etc., and we will then can deal with that in the next seven minutes. Um, Advocate Pillay, um, listening to you, um, you have concluded, I believe, I would have still granted that opportunity for concluding remarks. Um, from the South African Police Service, as well as from yourself, and then Director Roberts, because I see no additional hands being raised. It is indeed that we are here to engage, we are here to seek ways moving forward, and we always understand that there is, there is matters affecting crime that comes due to economic disempowerment, it comes due to social exclusion, and it even comes down to the fact that if a gang member is not caught and prosecuted, someone might be able to look up to him because they also want to become a gangster. But as this committee, we will continue with our oversight, we will continue with playing our role, but we are very fortunate to have had um, Major General Patekile here, Major Generals Vieri, Lincoln, and Mangi, as well as, um, I almost wanted to say the amazing Brigadier um, Foscale, who have previously engaged our committee on a number of times, as well as Director Roberts and UHD. So over to Saps, any concluding remarks? Um, uh, thank you, sir. We we just want to thank you for inviting us and to let us uh, come and present ourselves. But also, we just want that the responsibility out there is reciprocal. It is us and the community. And we have we want to believe that we've got community leaders, religious leaders and everybody. If we all stand up and, 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 and make sure that we, we we act responsible, all of us, in, uh, in uh, tackling the issue of crime in general. Uh, as we were saying, uh, General Very, in, 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 in Kylie Chow, that end, you got more problems with kidnappings and, and, and extortions that's coming, that's coming afore. And it needs uh, uh, people with stand to say, enough is enough, let us all stand up and say no. We've, we've done our inroads in making arrests and, and ter ter terminating groups, take them down. But we need a joint approach, the whole of society approach is the way to go with this. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, Chair, uh, to yourself and, and to the members. Uh, a special word of thanks uh, from the city of Cape Town and from the Safety and Security Directorate uh, in the city for this opportunity this morning uh, to come and to, to, to explain uh, the city's involvement with regarding uh, number one, uh, fighting crime uh, within the metropole, uh, but also our willingness to support the, the, the uh, uh, metropoles or the, the uh, municipalities in the, on our boundaries uh, to support them uh, our support to the South African police services with regarding to, to the, the, the task of fighting crime, uh, as our mandate is by law enforcement and traffic enforcement, and in terms of metro police uh, crime prevention, we are stand as one to, to, to support the, the police services in, in fighting the phenomena of, of gangsterism within the metropole. Uh, also, with, uh, with regarding we are always on a daily basis looking out how we can develop our strategies in supporting 
uh, the fight with regarding to the various uh, threats that are coming up on a daily basis in terms of crime. Should it be gangs? Should it be transport? Should it be land invasions? Uh, should it be uh, the general crime? Should it be operational approaches? We are always willing to support the, the, uh, the South African police services. And then lastly, I believe that uh, we should more utilize technology in the fighting against crime and to see how we can improve our relationship. In terms of LEAP, we are uh, uh, running with this program with the assistance and the collaboration of the, the province. And uh, we are putting more boots on the, on the ground in order to, to get the murders down within the metropole uh, and hopefully within the province as well. Thank you. That's all from my side. HOD, are you still with us? Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I don't have any further comments. I think I wrapped up a, a bit too soon, so my apology for that. HOD, thank you so much. From this committee side, thank you so much to all the Major Generals for your attendance here, Director um, Roberts, HOD members. We have a huge and monumental task ahead, but as safety is everyone's concern, we all have a role to play. We do appreciate that entities have taken and stakeholders have taken their time to to engage today. For those that are listening on YouTube and tuned in via MS Teams, thank you so much for your attendance. We will again encourage, as SAPS usually encourage, that if there's any member of the community that has information regarding any crime, if you can share that, that with your local SAPS station, we are all in it to ensure that we create a safer Western Cape. SAPS, City of Cape Town, we have COVID, I need to choose my words carefully. The members are online. I'm not sure how they will get it, but we have COVID compliant refreshments that will be served outside. And we will encourage members that have to have COVID compliant refreshments. It has been a long time, but our work will continue. The committee will deliberate and have our request for further information as well as the committee business. But you are now excused. And once again, thank you. Members of the committee, can we take a brief five minute comfort break? I've been sitting in this chair for close to four hours. Five minutes, we'll be back.
Is, are you all online? Yes, Chair. Thank you so much. Members, in terms of the way forward, I want to again express my thanks that you have all logged in and engaged. In terms of committee resolutions, requests for information, are we able to email further correspondence to Asim? We have made a note on a number of matters where SAPS indicated that they will be sending the additional information. I see Member Bosman giving a... Uh, Member Marie, your hand is up. Uh, Chairman, thank you so much. This was a most informative meeting. First of all, well, well, well managed by you as chairperson. I think the two things that struck me to which the General Viri and him agreed is that the POCOV Act needs amendment to make it easier for the police to convict persons belonging, promoting, or advancing gang activities. The act itself was poorly uh, drawn up, and we need to, to suggest that the legislation, Western Cape legislation in terms of our own constitution, can request national government to amend this act so that it can be a useful instrument to the police to get convictions against gangsters. And uh, that is one of the resolutions I want to propose. And the second one will be that the Western Cape Minister of Community Safety, the Minister of Public Works, and uh, the Minister of Human Settlements be requested to collaborate with each other in the establishment of police villages in the Western Cape so that the police can be housed in environments where they feel safe and that they're not being forced to live in crime-infested areas. And that is why our cops get killed, because they must prosecute criminals and then go back home and the criminal is his neighbor. How can we allow such an issue to, 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 to continue? So those are the two I want to suggest. Thank you so much, Member Maria, Member Bota, and Member Kama in that order. Sorry, Chair, technical difficulties. I just want to check what the response to my question, and I don't think it was entirely correctly responded to. So um, I want to know um, how many cases against SAPS members do we have in regard to SAPS members being on the payroll of gangsters? And um, how are um, current investigations uh, going? And then in regard to SAPS members that are in the on the payroll or have been convicted, or how many have been convicted that there was cases um, against? Um, and look, let's look at the last um, year. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of the year 2020, 2021, um, up until the latest date for when information is available. Is that in order? Thank you so much, Member Bota. I see Member Kama. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I won't repeat what uh, Member uh, Marais said about this meeting, but I want, uh, Chair, one for me, if we can get a footprint of the active CCTV cameras in the city of Cape Town, indicating the areas that they are found in. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thank you so much, Member Kama. Member Christians? Uh, Chair, I think, um, you know, what was shocking was um, the uh, le legal guns uh, in the hands of criminals. So can we get an update, uh, a report and an update on, you know, what is the process now in knowing that that 
licenses were issued fraudulently. I, 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 I don't know if that is under control. I want to know, you know, are those people, uh, the firearms away from that people? What is the process? I know they said there were two policemen involved and that, those, but, but, but that type of thing, uh, Chair, I'm worried about uh, gangsters, known gangsters that have legal firearms and that can take up to, can buy up to 10,000 rounds of ammunition. So that is my concern. If we can just get an update on that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. No, thank you so much, Member Christians. In terms of two of the questions that I've posed around the DNA, the validity, um, and that um, that was also a written question that I'm still waiting for a reply on. So that will be added into our um, request for information, as well as the, is that the DNA? Yes, that one that I had. I see now, Member um, Bosman, you indicated that you will email Wasim or your hand is up, and then Member McKenzie. Yes, thank you, Chairperson. I thought you made the proposal that we're all going to be sending our questions, but I, I will send uh, my questions because I do feel that my questions were either answered inadequately um, or they were just completely missed over in some instances. But what I do find reassuring is that um, Major General Patakile has um, assured this committee that the South African Police Service has a national competency, has the capacity within its crime intelligence unit to tackle crime. And I'm looking forward to some of the fruits of that capacity. Uh, we don't want police officers living um, next to criminals, but I also want to say that we don't want residents of the Western Cape living next to criminals. And we do need to, at some point, um, hold the police more to account for what they've done. I'm going to join Member Christians in saying that we do need a, an update, an emergency update on what the contingency plan is for the guns that have been identified as part of the ongoing Prince Lou investigation. But the rest, Chair, I will um, put in uh, written questions to Asim or through the parliamentary process because some of the things um, that we've heard today is quite disturbing. And I'm grateful that the City of Cape Town and the Provincial Department of Community Safety has been able to identify what they are doing. But based on what we've heard from SAP, I'm not entirely satisfied that SAP has a clear plan in place. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you so much, um, Member Bosman. Um, Wasim has noted that you will send that additional comments via email as well. Member McKenzie. Thank you, Chairperson. And I want to echo uh, Member Murray's statements. Thank you for uh, uh, highlighting this matter. It's a <coughs> topic that is very uh, special to me, gangsterism and crime, because it is destroying our communities. Chairperson, I, perhaps for future, if uh, the head of crime intelligence can do a presentation to us on the status of crime intelligence in the Western okay. Cape, what is their vacancy rate? Um, do they have sufficient equipment to function? Um, because I have not given what's happening in the province, given the fact that that Thursday evening when four people were shot in Beaconvale, two kids were killed, uh, uh, one would have expected an intelligence operation to prevent a retaliation, yet two days later we, do, we saw another uh, two people being killed. So I really doubt we have a function in crime intelligence in the Western State. So I would like us to get a presentation on crime intelligence. And then the second issue I would trying to understand with an operation, I think you call it lockdown two or something like that. Previously, there was Operation Thunder. Uh, is Operation Thunder still active, first of all? Uh, which was supposed to be, is supposed to, to, to deal with, obviously, with gang violence and all those issues. And now I heard, now you mentioned Operation Level Lockdown 2 or L2 or something like that. Uh, is there a new operation to deal with gangs? Is Operation Thunder still active? And those are things that I was hoping they will share with the committee, which they, for whatever reason, didn't. And then the question that I ask around the supply chain, because we heard now that there are inadequacies in the Western Cape. They can't do certain things because the procurement for all these big systems is done in national government uh, and not in the province. And I hope perhaps one day, Chairperson, it doesn't have to be the next committee, we can get a presentation on what is procured in the province 
and what is procuredness. Perhaps the, the, let's call it the, the uh, was seen the status of supply set supply chain in the Western Cape. So we can see what risks, like we saw now, what happened with the labs. We saw what happened with the, with the evidence that what could become potential risks for the Western Cape. Uh, uh, because right now, I don't know, next week batteries to, uh, cannot be supplied because National failed to procure, then all the vans will stand still in the Western Cape. Western Cape. We just don't know at this point. This point. So I just want us to consider that, please. Thank you so much, Member McKenzie. Um, that has been captured. One of the ones that I also had regarding um, lockdown two, I have submitted a parliamentary question with details in this regard, but I've noted that the PC will be furnishing us with the information. He said some of it might be sensitive as it deals with the proactive, um, com, um, the reactive approach, the proactive and the compact approach, the, the detection work, but, but that will be added as well. But members, thank you so much uh, for making it easy um, to um, to chair this committee, I do appreciate your engagement. We are able to to learn and grow together, but also hold each other and um, stakeholders accountable. So, bye bye, donkey. I have already apologized to Wasim that after the month of April we will become extremely busy, um, and he has not accepted my apology. But Wasim, thank you so much. Mary Ann, thank you so much. Members. On that note, I uh, did a hand go up. Member Kama, thank you for your nice message in the chat. But Chair. thank you so much. Yes, Member Kama. Yes, Chair. I, 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 I actually had wanted to ask, I then I wrote there on the chat, and exactly what was, I don't want a situation where we go back to say that department, this particular department does not um, uh, work well with us. One, on the issue of guns, I understood that when uh, Major General uh, Vieri was speaking, he said there's a court case on the issue, hence he even could not provide more information. So, so I was hoping that if we are going to be clear, because he even specifically said he's a, he's a witness in this uh, uh, court uh, process, uh, uh, the other one was going to be on this one, exactly, Chair, as to in terms of the intelligence operations, what are we looking at, if the member can also, uh, so that ourselves in preparation for that meeting were able to understand. Also understanding that some of these operations do not get to be represented to to people who have not been cleared. You see that even in the in the National uh, Portfolio Committee of Intelligence, that for you to serve in that particular committee, you must have been cleared, uh, you must have went through the process of security clearance. So, so those are the two questions that I wanted clarity on, Chair. Thanks. Thank you so much. I have noted that as well, Member Kama. What we will do is that once the resolutions has been typed up, um, it will be circulated and members can can um, can look at it before we send it off again. Is that in order, Wasim? Thank you so much, members. Um, Mackenzie and Postman, your hand is up. No, Chairperson, as member boys, I would say my hand needs to be chopped off. Oh, yes, but thank you so much. Member McKenzie, we wish you a speedy recovery and you are in our thoughts and prayers. Um, member Mare and every other member that may be having flu-like symptoms, please stay safe and enjoy the constituency period. Member Mare, as altijd lekker om vir u te sien. U lijkt al baie kwaad. Maar daar is een klomraad. Uh, speaker, my vrouw kom hier en sy gee vir my net voor ek moet praat a stuk lekker pikkelvies wat ek nie gauw genoeg kon eet nie en toe hoes ek. Sy kan maar nie as sy. Members, this meeting is officially adjourned and please enjoy the constitutional period. Drop off some pikkelvies, member Marie. Echt?